It's May the 19th, 2017 in Athens, Georgia. I am Cheryl Vogt, director of the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies. This interview is for the Russell Library at the University of Georgia and is part of the Russell Library's oral history documentary series. Today I'm interviewing three pioneers in the research, development, and use of in vitro fertilization and human reproduction in the United States. I'm going to start this interview by uh, giving our audience bios of our three participants so they'll have a better understanding as we continue our conversation about the different perspectives that these uh, participants come from. Dr. Benjamin Brackett is a native of Athens, Georgia, and attended the University of Georgia, where he received both PhD and DVM degrees. He then joined Luigi Mastrioni's laboratory in 1966 at the University of Pennsylvania, where he continued his pioneering research in sperm capacitation and in vitro fertilization that led directly to the development of IVF in humans. In 1983, he returned to UGA as professor and head of the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology in the College of Veterinary Medicine until his retirement in 2002. In 1983, with two physician partners, one of whom, Dr. Joe Massey, is with us today, he established Reproductive Biology Associates, an IVF clinic in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Brackett served as its president and chairman of the board until 1988. He has worked as an advocate to restore funding for contraceptive research and development, and served as consultant with the Office of Technology Assessment and the National Institutes of Health as an expert witness on IVF before Congress, and as a member of the Technical Advisory Committee for the Contraceptive Research and Development Program supported by the State Department. In recognition of his significant contributions to the scientific community, and the direct applications of his work in the medical, veterinary, and educational communities, Dr. Benjamin Brackett received the 2004 International Embryo Technology Society Pioneer Award. A native of France, Dr. Edouard J. Servi, attended medical school in Bordeaux, specializing in internal medicine with a focus on endocrinology and metabolic disease. As a re recipient of the highly prized Irene Bernard Grant, he came to Augusta, Georgia in 1969 for a research fellowship in reproductive endocrinology at the Medical College of Georgia under endocrinology pioneers Dr. Robert Greenblatt and Dr. Verinda Mahish. After completing a residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the Medical College of Georgia, Dr. Servi established his private practice in Augusta, and in 1976 he established the Servi Institute for Reproductive Endocrinology almost a decade before the advent of IVF in human reproduction. Dr. Servi's lab is responsible for the world's first human intrauterine insemination, artificial insemination as, as it is more commonly known, and the first vitro fertilization, in vitro fertilization embryo transfer at the blastocyst stage in the US, as well as the first live birth in the world after cryopreservation at the blastocyst stage following intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Dr. Servi is also a well-respected uh, expert in hysteroscopic and laparoscopic surgery. Dr. Joe Massey was educated at Emory College and School of Medicine in Atlanta and completed his residency and infertility fellowship training at the University of Pennsylvania. After service in the U.S. Navy, he began a private practice in Atlanta in obstetrics and gynecology with a considerable focus on infertility. He first studied IVF in Australia in the early 1980s. In 1983, he co-founded Reproductive Biology Associates in Atlanta with Dr. Brackett and another physician. The RBA clinic team led many advances in IVF, including the first intracytoplasmic sperm injection and the first egg freezing pregnancies in the US, and the first assisted hatching procedure in the world. In 2006, Dr. Massey practiced in upstate New York with Dr. Robert Kiltz at CNY Fertility Centers, a leader in low-cost IVF before returning to Georgia. A former national board member of the Society of Assisted Reproductive Technologies and Resolve, the National Infertility Association, which is an advocacy group, Dr. Massey currently serves on the board and advisory panels of several medical organizations. 
Presently, Drs. Servi and Massey are partnered as the Servi Massey Fertility Institute with the goal of providing full service, low cost treatment for IVF. In brief, Dr. Brackett had the first calf produced from IVF in the world. Dr. Brackett and Dr. Massey had the first human IVF live birth in Georgia, and Dr. Servi had the second. So, gentlemen, what was it like birthing those babies? Dr. Brackett, would you like to start since you had the first calf? Wow, it was <laughs> it was it was great excitement. Some of the some of the most exciting moments of my life uh, with the calf and then the baby in Georgia, the first baby in Georgia, and later on we had the first in vitro fertilized calf in Georgia, and that was about uh, 1988, I think. So 1981, we had the first calf in the world in Pennsylvania, and this was at New Bolton Center, the large animal campus of the University of Pennsylvania. And I was in an NIH study section meeting, and I got word that the cow was in labor. And I jumped in my car, and I broke all the speed records between <laughs> Washington and, and uh, Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, at, for that event. And later on, with the human, uh, when when I first learned that we had the first pregnancy, uh, got a phone call from Joe, and uh, he said, "Are you sitting down?" I said, "What? She's <laughs> pregnant." <laughs> and she was. That was in '83, and the baby, first baby in Georgia, was delivered in '84. On Father's Day. Yeah. Joe, what, what was that like for you when you had that, that was first baby? The culmination of a dream, and uh, it was it was pretty amazing. And we we knew Ben could make it happen for us. Uh, it, it came at a time when human IVF was very uncertain. There were a, a lot of people were trying to do it, and they weren't succeeding. Uh, we stood on the shoulders of a lot of science and as clinicians, uh, and we'll talk about that later, but basically uh, we knew it was plausible, but we didn't know if it was really going to happen. In our first month of trying to do this, we tried five patients and one of them conceived, so we were very lucky and very fortunate that Ben provided the science to make it work, and it was beyond exciting. It was, it was headline news in Atlanta. We were the press, uh, we had a press conference, and we had to tell them sort of what it was all about, but all three TV stations showed up, and the a Journal Constitution showed up, and it was it was a pretty exciting time. Oh, I think it'd almost be like the pride of fatherhood, too. Well, right. It was that, too. Yeah, it was. A, this was our baby, our mm -hmm. first baby. Edward? Yeah. <laughs> well, your pregnancy in Atlanta was also headline news in Augusta. And I was jealous because I had been, I had started to work uh, for, I had worked on the subject for about two or three years. But uh, after uh, some struggle, we finally had a first pregnancy. Unfortunately, sadly, she miscarried after, uh, in the first trimester. But uh, the same patient conceived uh, shortly afterwards. And I was still practicing obstetrics at the time. So uh, I've, this, I've delivered my first IVF baby, oh. and, uh, uh, and that was my last delivery, because once I knew that I was going to do IVF, I decided to stop practicing obstetrics. I knew I was going to be very busy. Anyway, it was wonderful. We had also a beautiful article on the, on the Augusta Chronicle, and, um, and uh, it was a wonderful time. I'd like for you to start with each of you telling me what led you personally toward a specialty in IVF technology and medicine. What specific events or people had the greatest impact on you in, in your um, days in college or other areas as you began your career? Um, ben, you want to start with that? Well, um, I, I could give this a long story or a short story. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually grew up just about a mile away 
from the University of Georgia campus. And we had 13 <coughs> acre, a small farm with all kinds of animals. We had uh, cows, horses, chickens. When I was very young, we even had a mule that plowed and pulled a wagon. And uh, so I was around all kinds of animals, dogs and cats. So I was inspired to be a veterinarian. And I really wanted to be a horse doctor. And I went to veterinary school and I learned so many things. And uh, my horizons were broadened. And by the end of veterinary school, I learned of a group in biochemistry led by a new professor, Dr. William L. Williams. And uh, there were several veterinarians involved in study biochemistry of reproduction, studying mainly sperm metabolism. And I became interested, they recruited me to, to, to pursue a PhD in biochemistry in that group. And uh, so that's sort of how I got started. The, impetus in reproduction in those days, this was back in 1962, mm -hmm. was to solve the world's population explosion problem. Uh, and with contracept, new contraceptive development, and we were interested in uh, how to stop the sperm from fertilizing the eggs. And M.C. Chang had recently succeeded with the first mammalian in vitro fertilization mm -hmm. and an embryo transfer in the rabbit. And I wanted to repeat his experiment because I realized fertilization was the most important biological event there is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's really how I got into it. And I could go on for hours, but I better let these gentlemen. <laughs> well, can I ask him a follow part of sure. a, sort of a follow up question? So. You really started off in the on the science as a pure science person, and then and part of it you knew was hopefully to apply the science for contraception. So when you heard when you heard about in vitro fertilization in the rabbit, did you think about it as a human uh, doing something in humans th that early? That was a good question. Actually, I didn't initially. Mm -hmm. uh, we were. In, uh, in the mode of learning, my interest was in learning more about the fertilization process with mm -hmm. the idea that if we can inhibit it, then we can have a maybe lead to a contraceptive. And if we could enhance it, it would promote development of animals and especially cattle for feeding the hungry world that we couldn't stop from growing. And so this was sort of the way we started. So it wasn't infertility then. But when all. I got into it, I did realize I had the thought before I finished my graduate work that someday maybe I'll go over to Atlanta and do this in people. Okay. So when you, you when you were at Penn though, your professor must have started talking about it in terms of human infertility because he was an infertility doctor, right? Right. That was, that was a, a good experience. Uh, I was invited by Dr. Luigi Mastroianni to come up to the University of Pennsylvania to give a seminar. Uh, he was a newly appointed head of obstetrics and gynecology in the medical school at Penn. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in my seminar, I just gave the science that we had developed in the rabbit. And he had also had fellows working on rabbit in vitro fertilization. And uh, at the end of my seminar, Dr. Mastroianni uh, proposed that we continue this with his patients because he had the patient demand of infertility and uh, saw the way that we could put this maybe through rabbits, monkeys, into people clinically. And that's how we developed our relationship at the University of Pennsylvania and made it one of the foremost centers for dealing with infertility. And that would have been the early 1960s. That was 1965, mm -hmm. 66. I joined his department in 66. Mm -hmm. 
Joe, do you want to follow on that with what? Okay, well, who, who sort of influenced per, you and do my personal mm -hmm. story? Um, if we come back to the science and all of that mm -hmm. later, but, right? <clears throat> um, I, after, in medical school, enjoyed delivering babies and decided obstetrics was a good thing for me to go into in terms of a specialty for the reason that I knew part of it would be delivering babies, but I was also intrigued by infertility. Um, I had personal experience with infertility in my family. I had two uncles who had infertility. So it was all very mysterious. Nobody really knew anything about my uncle's infertility. They didn't talk about it. Um, I'm thinking this can happen to me. I really want to know about it. Uh, so there was some empathy there. Uh, and I thought it was fascinating. And so I really thought, okay, you can do the, have the obstetrical part and also do infertility and learn about a, what was then an evolving field. It was very limited actually then, uh, but, but that, was my, that was my impetus. So when I, after I finished Emory, I started looking through the journals to figure out where I wanted to go to learn about infertility because I didn't want to do it at Grady. I didn't want to do, try to learn about infertility at Grady. There, was no, there were no teachers, so I started looking in the journals. And there were about four places that were leaders in the country. Um, case was, it, and basically I wound up at Penn. Uh, Luigi Mastroianni was there. And there was another fellow there uh, to sort of interdigitate with your conversation about the contraceptive research. The other leader at the University of Pennsylvania was Celso Ramon Garcia, who was one of the key people on the clinical trials of the birth control pill. So in the field of sort of reproductive endocrinology, it wasn't called that at the time, you were sort of expected to learn about contraceptive techniques and contraceptive technology and probably going to do some contraceptive research as well as learn about infertility. So it was all very interesting to me. Dr. Serby, you came from France to yeah. Georgia. <coughs> well, first time, um, I was not in OBGYN. I was, uh, on, I was an internist. And I was an internist who was subspecializing in endocrinology. And uh, when I was sent over here, I thought I was going to just uh, take care of thyroids and adrenals and diabetes and uh, obese patients. And uh, I found myself in a department where they were dealing mainly with reproduction. And uh, I, was, I came to the department, a wonderful department. Where, uh, Dr. Greenblatt was the chairman. And he was surrounded by uh, biochemists, wonderful biochemists, Dr. Mahesh, who had, who had uh, was coming from uh, Cambridge and Yale, Dr. Muldoon, the a cytogenetician, Dr. Roger Bird, and is a uh, doctor who was, had been hired from, uh, from the Netherlands, Dr. Hank Scholler, to do radioimmunoassay. That was something very new, and that was the first time we could measure hormone in a uh, in, uh, few ml of blood instead of collecting 24-hour urine. So anyway, uh, I fell in love with this. And uh, Dr. Greenblatt had a lot of infertility patients that he was uh, treating. Uh, he had uh, just come up with the Clomid, the famous fertility pill. And he was also uh, involved a lot in uh, the uh, trial for birth control. And he was using the birth control pill as uh, actually for infertile patients. He was using the the rebound phenomenon. He would place the patient for two or three months on birth control pill, hoping that uh, there would be a rebound in ovulation f after that. So anyway, I spent a whole year uh, in this environment, then went back to France doing my military service, finished my sp specialty in internal medicine. And I was offered a very good job in southern France. In, uh, in fact, uh, they were creating a nuclear medicine center and. Uh, and uh, at the same time that that job, job was offered, I received an invitation to come back to Augusta and do a obstetrics and gynecology a, a residency in, in OBGYN. And uh, I knew that I was 
in love with repro endo, reproductive endocrinology, and uh, I decided to to take a drop <laughs> to dro to drop something that was very promising for something that was that might pay less for the time being, but that was. Uh, uh, in, that was going to be better in the long, in the long term. So um, I did my residency in OBGYN, and during my residency, uh, a lot of things were happening. Dr. Brackett was doing all his work, uh, Dr. Mastroeni. Uh, Dr. Greenblatt was not too involved in, uh, in in vitro fertilization, but I was going to, to Hopkins, to John Hopkins, where George Anna and uh, Howard Jones were the leaders of the in OBGYN, but they were also very involved in the, in research, and they were in association with um, Dr. Pierre Soupard in at Vanderbilt, and uh, and they were working also with the with the future uh, uh, the future uh, parents of the future creators of the first IVF baby, Dr. Edward and Stepto. So anyway, I, I was going to all those meetings, and I remember going to a meeting in uh, New Orleans, where Dr. Uh, Steptoe was giving, uh, was talking to a bunch of laparoscopists about, about his experience, and everybody was amazed. And really, I'm pretty sure that 90% of the of the audience did not understand what he was talking about. But uh, anyway, when I went in practice. That was the first thing I, I wanted to do, and and uh, uh, when we found out that Dr. that uh, Bob Edwards and Dr. Steptoe and Patrick Steptoe had their first IVF babies, we we knew that was possible. So we knew it was possible, mm -hmm. but then that baby was born in '78, right? The, the they had the first pregnancy in '76. Which well, they had a baby pregnancy in 76, yeah. but the first baby was born two years later. Mm. Louise Brown in 78. Yeah, so they had tried 457 <laughs> times, mm. and they wound up with two babies in England. So it was not ready for clinical use, to say the least, then. And in, in, in 1982, um, it became the Australians had done some new things, they'd improve the, the stimulation of patients, and and they were getting to success rates that were, in, instead of one or half of one percent success, it was 15 percent. At that point, uh, my partner, Hilton Court, and I said, you know, it's time to really learn how to do this, and and we needed a scientist, because we knew we were just clinicians, and we knew the science was the key. So. We had, I called Ben up one day and said, Ben, if, could you do it in humans in Atlanta? And I'll let you tell the story from there about how that went. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start back a little bit. In, in, my, uh, in my graduate work, uh, we had, at the University of Georgia with Dr. Williams, we invited Dr. Chang down to show us how to do in vitro fertilization because he had published in 1959, and this was 1964, 63, uh, show us how to do it. And so he came down. In and, mice or rabbits? In rabbits. Rabbits, okay. And Dr. Chang was unable to repeat his experiment. Hmm. And he, he taught us some things though. And, and when he left, I realized that now this process takes place in the uh, oviduct or fallopian tube. Now, what's the temperature of the fallopian tube? We're out here <laughs> in the room, and uh, we learned that uh, temperature was extremely important. These initial, our initial results were reported by Dr. Williams at the World Congress of Animal Reproduction in Trento in 1964. And in that audience, Dr. Edwards was present in the audience. So he became aware of the Georgia effort. Uh, I'm making, I'm building up to. Okay, yeah, yeah. But uh, the difficult thing, and uh, it's just 
the way human nature works. Uh, Dr. Williams was in a big hurry to catch the plane to go to Trento or to meet the deadline for the written manuscript for his short paper, for the short paper. And he included everybody's name in the lab but Brackett. And it was Brackett's work that was the in vitro fertilization, our initial results. And so that was the printed version in the World Congress of Animal Reproduction. Uh, when he was about to catch his plane, he was running around making another copy of the paper with my name on it to pass out to anybody who came to his talk. Uh, he apologized profusely, and I, it didn't matter to me because I was enjoying doing the work, you know. And, uh, but the interesting thing is Dr. Edwards, in his subsequent in many publications, he referenced this work, but without bracket on the, mm -hmm. on the end of it. So that's, that's, that's one so thing. So that was in the 60s, okay. But, but right. this was 64, mm -hmm. and then that's... I went on to 66, developing in vitro fertilization. And by 1965, I had learned that, you see, we had to use sperm from the uterus of rabbits, from mated rabbits, because we didn't know about sperm capacitation uh, until, well, night, well, sperm capacitation was, it was realized in 1951, independently by Austin and Chang, Austin and rats, and Chang and rabbits, that sperm had to reside in the female tract before they could fertilize. So, our early work was all with sperm from mated rabbits. We realized that the pH of those of the aspirated fluid from the uterus of the rabbit was high. And there was other work in the laboratory looking at oviductal fluid. And Dr. Charles Hamner, a colleague, realized that oviductal fluid at the time of fertilization was high, seven point, pH 7.8. So what we did was to uh, concoct a medium that would enable sperm to penetrate eggs by duplicating the conditions of the, of the oviduct with the temperature and with elevated bicarbonate in the medium to have a high pH and by replacing serum proteins with crystalline albumin, we had a defined medium for fertilization of mammalian eggs, the first. And that they were was, very excited about that. That was huge, yeah. So Dr. Servi at Hopkins with the Joneses and Bob Edwards came over, R.G. Edwards, Robert G. Edwards, 2010 Nobel Laureate, but then he was just beginning. Mm -hmm. And he came over to work with the Joneses and Bill Williams, and he had struck up a friendship because they had a common interest from the Trento meeting in 1960, 1964. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Williams gave Dr. Edwards the results, my results, and the medium that I had developed. Dr. Edwards, in turn, took that information and in his lab back home at Cambridge, gave it to his graduate student, Barry Bavister, and said, try this. Barry tried it. And Barry was a, a very conscientious worker. <clears throat> and before the end of the year, they had two publications with sperm penetration of hamster eggs in vitro and sperm penetration of human eggs in vitro. Uh, well, it might have been a year or so in there. But anyway, the, the medium was touted by Edwards as Bavister's medium. And with a British accent, who could deny that that wasn't a <laughs> magnificent thing? And so, so that's a little insight. Our first publication uh, 1964, then 1965, uh, we published the first repeatable in vitro fertilization, mammalian in vitro fertilization, and this was rabbit that 
I'd learned from Chang, and before Chang, I gotta say that there were early workers in France, and the French had found that uh, they could get fertilization, but they didn't transfer the resulting embryos, and Chang was the first to do that. Uh, the French workers included <clears throat> Dauge and Thibault. Uh, Dr. Thibault, we both knew mm -hmm. as a friend. And uh, so the, um, to continue on a bit, mm -hmm. I, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, in 1966 and, uh, and worked with Luigi Mastroianni, our plan to do rabbit, monkey. As a veterinarian, I was a managing director of the primate colony, which consisted of 300 rhesus monkeys. <laughs> this was a tremendous financial investment, and it was made possible by the Ford Foundation. And Luigi had the best, the stainless steel cages and everything for the monkeys, and. So I got a little update in my monkey medicine and, uh, and went to take care of those animals as well as to continue this research. And uh, gee whiz, it was a long time after that that we got that phone call. I had already moved, that was eight years later uh, because I was in the department of OBGYN where I knew Joe and uh, and he was aware, and, and many of the people in the same cohort of MDs in training and Ford Foundation sponsored fellows from countries around the world uh, learned from us in well, vitro fertilization. Yeah, here's the here's your paper from 1971. <laughs> okay, Mike cites who was an MD postdoc student under you and with Luigi and a fellow named Roca, published this paper, Mexican. Cleavage of Human Ova in Vitro, and published in 71, so you must have present, done the work in 70. I got there in 68, so this was yeah. while I was there. And <clears throat> I remember this fellow, Mike Seitz, going into the operating room and I don't know if this will show up on video, but uh, basically taking uh, wedges of ovarian tissue that was done for a certain medical condition called polycystic ovaries. We saw that the doctor sometimes would take ovarian tissue out and you could pop the little follicles with a scalpel or a needle and sometimes find an egg. And there's pictures of the eggs. I remember seeing my first human egg with my sights and being pretty much in awe just seeing an egg. The, 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 the paper goes on to show how they did the, what they did to the sperm, which was, again, the idea was that you had to put the, at that point, we <clears throat> thought you had to put the sperm in the uterus, so they took the human sperm, put it in the uterus of a monkey. Mid-cycle rhesus monkeys. Then got the sperm back out and then put it with the eggs. That's right. And if they didn't, they tried it with and without the, the uterine capacitation and it didn't work without it at That's that right. point. That's correct. Don't, you can tell us later why. But then they proudly went on to show embryo eggs had, had fertilized and turned into embryos and I believe these were the most advanced human embryos at that, t that had been published at that time. Nobody else had published embryos that got beyond about four cells. And as you pointed out in this paper, human or and other em mammalian embryos can get to four cells by parthenogenesis. In other words, they can be activated and start dividing. And if they don't get beyond four cells, you don't know if they're really fertilized or, or not. De degenerative fragmentation they just fragment. so these embryos got to so one of them 12. got to 12 cells so so that was really the most advanced human fertilization experiment that had been published at that time so that was that was pretty profound that was very very amazing and in the same year you published uh, an, another paper 
on rabbit over uh, cleaving, and you were studying the the relationship with the zona pellucida and the what, what could happen. around and the surrounding right. vestments of the egg. So he was doing a lot of work on sort of the details of what would make this <coughs> work the best in, right. in animals and, and in humans. Well, yeah. I, I, yeah, we should continue this and I'll get back to the phone call. All right, well, we're not ready for the phone call yet. Not ready for the well, phone I do, call. I do want to follow up on something. Because uh, Joe, you mentioned that was the first time you had seen a human egg, and yeah. I just wanted to, to say um, how did that differ from the other eggs that you had seen before, the, the mammal eggs? Um, or had you ever seen one in medical yeah. school? Do they yeah. teach eggs? Well, no, no, of course not. No, they didn't <laughs> teach, teach that. No, no, no. I, had I seen any eggs, a free egg Probably uh, some parasite in an eggs. animal? No, because I hadn't, I hadn't been in the animal lab. So... Mm -hmm. So I hadn't seen uh, rabbit eggs or even mice right. eggs. Mouse but then eggs I think he said there's very little difference in, in the, the striking. Yeah. They look alike. Mm -hmm. That they're all very similar. They look a lot. They look. They're just different sizes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit different size, and it, and the trained eye can tell the difference, but only if you're into it. Uh, so the next year you went on to do embryo transfer, further work in that rabbits to, uh, I don't yes, know what exactly right. the advance was in this in this paper, right. but it's continuing to do groundbreaking research in, in IVF, basically, in yeah, rabbits. Yeah, we were continuing the rabbit work because at, at that time we were very concerned about uh, the incidence of success, what, what was being told to patients, infertile patients, in these centers that were doing it. And the centers that were doing it were not in the United States of America, and they were uh, Bob Edwards, and uh, he was really a leader, and the Australians mm -hmm. picked up pretty soon after mm -hmm. that. But this was, uh, this was one of the earliest. In, in the 1970, we reported this work. And so we were right with the... I would say the 1960 to 1980 period was really critical in the development yeah, uh, of yes. IVF. Yeah. And it was... Um, but also, we continued the rabbit work, mm -hmm. and at the uh, we had rabbit offspring from in vitro fertilization where we recovered the eggs from the follicles. The previously, mm -hmm. they were flushed from the oviducts, ovulated mm -hmm. eggs. Uh, and the eggs we recovered from follicles, we were able to fertilize and transfer and get live offspring. And I was able to, I had an opportunity to present this work at the American Fertility Society meeting in New York City in February, the end of February, 1972. And uh, this was a plenary session in the big ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria in New York City, and after my talk where I showed the, the baby rabbits and I said this is in its infancy, and I was, I was approached by a practicing obstetrician gynecologist in New York City, Dr. Keefe of St. Vincent's Hospital, wanted to, me to come and extend this to his infertile patients. And that was very early, 1972. Mm -hmm. But I had the, the reservation that we didn't know enough in animals to be able to have any idea of incidence of success and whether the offspring would be normal until we had more experience. and. So I, uh, in consultation with my department head, Dr. Mastroianni, we were of the mind that it was not appropriate to do human work at that time. And that was in contrast to the British and Australians mm -hmm. who were far behind us actually with the underpinning science for doing reproductive biology. 
So this is the background mm -hmm. that uh, we. So yes, yeah, so, early. So in early England, work. right, Steptoe and Edwards tried 457 times, and finally, out of that, got two babies. One of which was the famous Louise Brown, and that was in '78. But this but, was over a period was, of time because they were beginning yeah. about the time we were. Uh, early 70s. They were doing humans in the early 70s. And so those cases mm -hmm. were over a number of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'd see in uh, releases that they put out that they had uh, pregnancy, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and we had the joke around our lab that it was the longest human pregnancy there ever was. <laughs> Make the... Uh, book of World Records. Well, they had their first pregnancy was a miscarriage, yeah. and then they had an ectopic. Yeah. I think the ectopic was 76. In 19, so. 1971, uh, they went in front, front of the British, and they'd go in front of the television, and they would talk about what the wonderful things they were going to do with overcoming mm -hmm. infertility. And they announced at that time that they had a uh, human embryo developed in the laboratory to the 100-cell stage. That was January of 1971. Mm. In February, there was a Boston uh, newspaper article that I saw that uh, where James Watson testified in front of a congressional committee. And... Uh, his take was, do we really want to do this? His advice to the United States was to, you know who James Watson was, the Nobel laureate, DNA, the double helix, famous for his right. book, the double helix. So his, his position was that, do we really want to do this? And he thought the United States should appoint a committee, a commission, immediately and proceed to forbid it. And that was the, the common ethics throughout this country for another decade. But, but this country didn't get the first IVF baby because of the... Exactly. Because of the, sens of the sensitivity and... Uh, and they were in the, 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 British, the British and the Australians were, were working in a more liberal environment. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have this. And this, is, this brings another thought. In uh, 1966, we had a new laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania, the Division of Reproductive Biology. And uh, visitors came from all over the world. One of our first visitors was Dr. Hayashi. Hayashi, in Japan, mm -hmm. had already published pictures of eggs that he, that he had worked with. And he came up to me, and I'll never forget him telling me, you're rich in this country. You can work with animals. We have to use our human patience. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. 1967 <clears throat> probably was when he came. So Dr. Pierre Supa was ahead of his time, like you, like you were, and he yes. tried to get a grant and uh, he presented that to the NIH, and uh, there was a lot of food dragging at the time, and uh, nothing, nothing came out. He never got funds. He, he was a, a superb investigator, Pierre Supar, uh, and we had much in common with, and he had actually in 1972 published a pro-nuclear human egg that, that he had obtained in his work at Vanderbilt University. And Pierre had a, put in a proposal to NIH to continue his work. And uh, it was scientifically approved, but it was held up because of the various ethics uh, layers of ethical commissions, a board of ethics, and then the ethics advisory board that was had to review those any human work after 1972. I was fortunate in that I got the first contract to do human in vitro fertilization. This was 1970 to 1972. 
and the it was fertilization of primate ova, and it was our idea was to do. We had a lot of experience in rabbits and to move it through non-human primates, the rhesus monkey, and continue these human experiments that we that we had already started. But we were told by NIH that if we continued our human experimentation, that all the governmental support to the University of Pennsylvania would be terminated. Mm -hmm. And this was oh. the, the de facto moratorium that was imposed by the handling through the, let's see, I guess it was initially uh, the Nixon administration, the Ford because, administration, the, the, all the way to the Carter administration until Secretary Califano appointed uh, the board, mm -hmm. or he got the report of an ethics board. He said, um, IVF holds enormous promises, but raises questions that reach to our most profound moral and ethic beliefs. That was the so super that? proposal. Yeah. That, that was, was really... That was so, Califano saying that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So exactly what was the ethical issue? I mean, they just they, were... Was it safety or just the whole idea that this was happening outside the body and I, I, it made people with certain religious persuasions uneasy or what? I think, think I was partly responsible for that because my department head... Dr. Luigi Mastroianni held the same view that we needed more animal experimentation mm -hmm. for those reasons. Yeah, we wanted we, to. We wanted to make sure it was safe. He thought it should be done in primates. Could be first. done. They were they were afraid they were going to create monsters. You know, they yeah. were afraid. Yeah. Beings. We didn't know. We didn't know. Yeah. It you was didn't know if it was going to be safe, right? I remember. Yeah. I mean, I remember Howard Jones saying that he basically sweated through the whole pregnancy of the country of this. Yeah. Yeah. baby that happened in the United States, mm -hmm. not knowing for sure if this baby was going to be okay. Yeah. Even though they'd had births in England, you just, it was early and it was, yeah. you didn't know from the animal work any reason why the human babies would be a problem, but you didn't know for sure. That's right. So. And it was, it was, it was very interesting that nature takes care of those abnormal embryos and it's a normal process in human reproduction. We did, we did kind of know that, but we really, we, and and from the laboratory animal experiments, I mean, it was sort of that. That was the indication, and so it was reasonable to assume that that things would go well. Well, there there were several several objections. The first one was uh, they were frowning upon a collection of sperm. Uh, Masturbation was something that people, that uh, some religious uh, persons didn't right. didn't approve, and then there was the um, the fertilization out of the body. They wanted fertilization to take place in the body, and that's they were again. I think the the Catholic Church was v very involved in 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 that uh, kind of uh, reproach to to, mm -hmm. to to what we were to what we wanted to do. And uh, finally, the third objection later on was the, the cryopreservation of the embryos, which is now still uh, frowned upon. We, we know that we have uh, cryopreserved embryos in the, in the banks uh, all over mm -hmm. the country, which we don't know if they're going to be human beings any time soon. Yeah, all of those were very high in the minds of most of the people who gave it any thought. Um, ben, I know that you did some congressional um, testifying for congressional hearings about, um, about this. What was the attitude that you found uh, with the congressional committee investigating this? This was, uh, this was following the success of the Cambridge group, of the Bob Edwards and Steptoe, mm -hmm. Patrick Steptoe. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next week, they invited me to come down to testify in Washington in front of the Rogers 
subcommittee on health of interstate mm -hmm. commerce or whatever. And uh, so I remember I hastily put together something to, to tell them. And I went down and I, I had slides and I, I just gave them a seminar. I gave, over, I gave, I talked more than an hour uh, bringing them up to date on in vitro fertilization. And at that time, the published work of Lopata from Australia mm -hmm. with a few uh, just very modest fertilizations. It was about the only thing that existed, I mean, in, that, that, was, that was really solid, I guess. And uh, although there are claims of human in vitro fertilization, lots of, you know, that were kind of disregarded as was the case with the animals until we learned about sperm capacitation. But uh, the, the, the reception was very good. Chairman Rogers was excellent in helping me to uh, convey the idea that this was really pro-life uh, and that we would solve a problem for many people mm -hmm. who are infertile if we can develop this technology and put it into place. But at the same time, my plea was for more money for research and animals. Mm -hmm. But also, the, uh, let's see, yeah, also by that time, uh, we had some experience in human a long time ago, and that was toward the end of this ethics review and their recommendations in 1979, they, they made a report to HEW, to Cal Secretary Califano, I guess, and their recommendations were to do animal experimentation, to develop the technology, the science, and then they went on with uh, the human experimentation to be done, could not involve transfer of embryos. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, what else? They had another that was, stipulation. But that was for government funding, right? Yeah, for government funding. Yeah. If, if they did, well, they couldn't keep the embryos alive longer than 14 days. And uh, then if they did get to the point to be able to transfer the embryos into patients, then it should only be done within the marriage, husband, wife, because this was another big violent concern about misuse or the slippery slope argument mm -hmm. of all these wonderful things for people that are going on today. <laughs> Back then, mm -hmm. were not, were not, not at all, mm -hmm. uh, not at all of interest. So. Um, so, Dr. Servi, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you started your lab in as early as 1976. As part of your medical practice, this was a reproductive lab. Well, we, we were more, we, we were not in IVF then. We were, uh, we were concerned with infertility, obviously, and I was doing a lot of surgery. In fact, we uh, was one of the, the first in the country to do macrosurgery microsurgeries on fallopian tubes. And already women wanted to have their uh, tubal sterilization reversed. So <laughs> we were using microscope to do, to do that kind of surgery and maybe you did that too at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we had all those patients who had uh, diseased tubes, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, and then the tubes had to be removed. And obviously we were, at the time we were looking and following all the works of Dr. Brackett, Dr. Supa, and all those people who were working on the subject. But uh, mainly my, my lab was, con was uh, mainly about uh, radioimmunoassay of hormone and about um, uh, andrology. There was, the American Society of Andrology was created about that, at that time, and I was one of the first members there. And, uh, that's when we uh, had the idea of uh, doing intrauterine insemination. 
Up until then, the inseminations were done with a, with a cup uh, placed on the, on the cervix or with uh, just a tuberculin syringe placing the, the sperm just at the beginning of the cervix. The reason is that if you were inserting, the sperm contains uh, the seminal plasma, there are two components, the spermatozoa and the seminal plasma, which is the vehicle. And that, that seminal plasma contains prostaglandins and also could be infected, could, could, cause, could have germs and so forth. And if you insert the sperm directly into the, the uterus, and some people have done that before, you, you could cause a terrible infection, uh, cramps, and uh, up to an anaphylactic shock. So, um, so, so uh, one year, one of the Dr. Brackett's uh, colleague, veterinarian, Dr. Erickson, uh, Ron Erickson, came to see us in Augusta. He, and with my, my uh, PhD, uh, Dr. John Black, who was also coming out of the Department of Endocrinology, we spoke to him and he said, you know, I know how to separate, uh, to separate uh, Y sperm, female sp Y sperm and X sperm, male sperm and female mm -hmm. sperms. And um, indeed he had, uh, he was using gradient albumins and making the sperm migrate. And at the end, we, at the end of the, the column, we were making slides and using uh, colloidal gold we could stain the Y sperms. And we saw that 90% of the sperms effectively was, was male. So they was going to do sex selection and he was practicing sex selection in, in bovine. And he was, he was claiming a big success. And uh, so we, we, we had, a, at the time we didn't have uh, uh, internet and we didn't, but somehow <laughs> the advertisement was such that we had at least 40 couples that came down to, to Augusta to, to, to do that sex selection. And so uh, that's at that time that I designed a, a, a catheter with a, a 18 gauge needle that I sewed up and I put a red, red rubber number six uh, uh, French rubber catheter at the end. It was much cheaper than now because we, could ca we can uh, we can sterilize those cap in a, in the autoclave. So now, now mm -hmm. every catheter costs, uh, costs uh, 30 or 40 dollars. But um, anyway, we um, inserted, we, after, after separation of the sperm from the seminal plasma, we had the sperm that could be, and that, that was done under sterile condition, we could insert the sperm into the, the uterus. So that's, that was pretty much serendipity. It was, uh, we, it, it was necessity, and it, they were the first intrauterine insemination in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, nobody caught up, and even us, we didn't do too many, what we call that IUI, we didn't do too many for, for two or three years, and then we started to do that on patients who had, who had had surgery of the cervix. We were, and uh, the, so what, what is amazing is that uh, actually, intrauterine insemination, which is the most common uh, assisted reproduction procedure performed in the, in the world now, happened after in vitro fertilization. The, the, the first IUIs came after, after the first IVF. Mm -hmm. but so, your, but your first one was what? What year was that? that Nineteen seventy-eight, the year of Louis Brown. Okay. Yeah, but in general <laughs> usage, it didn't come in until considerably later. But oh, 1985, 1986. 85 or so, yeah. In, yeah. Fact, in fact, we presented in Chicago. I had a, a fellow uh, working with me, and she, she went to Chicago to present uh, my first series of, of IUIs, mm -hmm. and that was in 1985. And everybody then started to catch on. And, and mm -hmm. That was that, mo monumental, actually. It, it was, to, to do that in, yeah. in people. Mm -hmm. I ha that brings a thought about the animal world. When I uh, got my notoriety for having the world's first test tube calf, uh, I had a correspondence from a gentleman who had uh, similar newspaper coverage of the first test tube calf after he had done artificial insemination mm -hmm. in cows in must have been 1950, early 1950s. And 
the artificial insemination industry in cattle really took off in 1951. And uh, mm -hmm. they learned, as, as you did, mm -hmm. that they could, uh, could inseminate more cows, you know, with, mm -hmm. with intrauterine insemination. And now they've refined it to the point that sexing of sperm has come of age but it's not through Dr. Erickson's procedure. Yeah. It's through cell sorting cell because sorting. there's a little right. difference in the, uh, the weight of uh, sperm with XX and XY. The Y chromosome is a little less dense. And so in a cell sorter, very sophisticated uh, instrumentation, can be separated, X and Y sperm, and it doesn't separate. Well, now they've improved that greatly, but they do have enough sperm, and with uh, increased emphasis on just exactly what you were doing in cattle, they can inseminate cows with fewer sperm by putting them further up the track, further up the reproductive track to get male or female calves. And this is in practical use mm -hmm. as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to add that um, that technique in human really didn't work very well because although we were selecting 90% of Y sperm and 10% of female sperm, mm -hmm. uh, the, the results were ended up with, we had 50% girls and 50% boys. In other words, the few uh, female sperm that were making it through the through the gates and were just as just pow as powerful or more powerful than the white sperm. So so we when so patients still getting natural selection. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> the last time I saw Ron Erickson was at uh, at a at a reproduction meeting, I guess, and and he uh, he really was commercial, completely commercial then, and I did get a a cap from him. Uh, the sperm firm <laughs> is he, X, XY genetics. The, the sperm yeah. firm. Yeah, he still claims that works. It yeah, he was, he was, of course, it doesn't. But he was yes. he, he was disappointed with us. <laughs> he was disappointed because I told him, you know, it's nice in vitro. It's it's mm -hmm. nice, but but it doesn't work. Yeah, but now they have more sophisticated ways to look at. Even yeah, but, that, yeah, yeah, but when, think, they, uh, when they do the, the cell sort, the sperm is not active, so they have to do in vitro fertilization uh, right, 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 with, right. with the sperm yeah, they select. Yeah. They, they cannot uh, inseminate yeah, it. Yeah, because yeah, you don't have yeah, enough sperm. That's right. Yeah. ICSI. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did want to ask, with your uh, reproductive uh, lab um, in the 70s, did you have an, you had an institutional review board, or did you have to... Oh, well, what uh, kind of, uh, well, that was not in the 70s. That was after, after the Jones experience, after the... Uh, that was probably before, before Joe had her first... Joe and, and, mm -hmm. and Ben had their first baby. Uh, we, we went to the university hospital in Augusta, and uh, I wanted to do my procedures in the hospital, so we, we had to go into the, in front of the institutional review board to, to, be, uh, to be granted the, the right to, to start the, la the, the lab. And I remember presenting my, um, presenting my, my case and saying, is, uh, one of the orthopedic surgeons who was on the board <laughs> asked me, what is your, your success rate? Mm -hmm. So I told him, well, it's about uh, 10, 15 percent. And he was, doing, he was an orth orthopedic surgeon uh, specialized in back surgery. So I told him 15 or 15 percent. He said, that, that's, that's not good enough. 15% is not good. So I asked him the question in front of the whole board. I said, doctor, I won't tell his name. Said, what is your success rate in back surgery? That has nothing to do with it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the, the board gave, gave us uh, their, appro their approval and we could, we, we could start. But then when we, when we moved to the to, to my office because when we started to do to retrieve eggs uh, through by sonographic uh, procedure we didn't, we didn't well first first we had to give up the, the hospital because they were keeping their we were re retrieving by laparoscopy mm -hmm. and they were keeping their rooms so cold that they were giving cold shock 
to, mm. to, to our uh, OO sites. And that my first failures were due to that, to the cold shock. So we were getting very beautiful embryos that we were transferring, but somehow, and, and my uh, consultant, Dr. Menezo, who came by, he said, you know, you give cold shocks to your, to your embryos. And as soon as we started to, to warm them up, I should have talked to Dr. Brackett first. You know? <laughs> wow. and as soon as we started to warm them up, we started to have pregnancies. The egg, yeah. So anyway, we went to, to the, to the office. We moved from the hospital to the office. I built my first my first lab there, you know, with our with my own funds. <laughs> and um, at that time, there was we had to be careful with sensitivity of the of the public. There was it was a very sensi sensitive uh, mm -hmm. topic, especially yeah. in a small town like Augusta. This was not a big city of, of Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had a, a an ethics committee. With a preacher, a nurse, and uh, and a, a lab technician. So when when a couple was requesting IVF, we would uh, we would put uh, that uh, in front of the of the committee. Oh, really? And and the committee was pretty strict because they wanted to to have always a father figure and a mother figure, and uh, they were they did not. Uh, we, they didn't have necessarily to be married, but they had to be at least living together. So things have, have moved tremendously since then. Now the committee, who named the committee? Under whose... Uh, I, actually, I, I named the committee. Oh, so you did. So, I, I, you, I did, so I did. you did it for the production asked, of your I asked lab. them to volunteer for the, for the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like when we got to the 1980s, things just sort of broke open. Um, and I know that, uh, Joe, you wanted to go to Australia and see what they were doing there. If you want to tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> yeah, so in the time frame when Edward was talking about when IVF became clinically applicable, it was about the time when the Australians started reporting 15% success. At that, at that point, it seemed like it was reasonable for, some, for a woman to go through what she had to go through, a laparoscopy and the drugs and all the expense to consider this as a, as a treatment. Um, hundreds of doctors, probably thousands around the world, wanted to learn how to do it. But there were only a few places that were really good at it. The big clinic in, in England, um, it was had moved from a university setting to a place called Bourne Hall. They weren't really teaching people in depth very much. They were kind of keeping things a little close to their chest. My partner got an invitation to go there. Hilton Court got to go, but he stayed for three days. So, so I, I thought we needed to know more than three days worth. So, so we came up with it. After I made the phone call to Brackett and he said he would consider this is working with me and trying to make this work in humans in Atlanta. Uh, we tried to figure out where we were going to go, and we were aware that this place called Monash University, under the under the leadership of an animal scientist, actually named Alan Trounson, uh, had been making great strides. So we wanted to go there. So my ticket to get to go to Australia was I called Alan. I met. I saw Alan Transit at a meeting and I said, do you think Ben Brackett could do this in humans? And he knew who Ben Brackett was. He said, sure, Ben Bra Brackett can do it in the humans and we'll show him how to do it if he'll come and do IVF in Australia in the sheep because it hadn't been done in the sheep. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that I would go and observe human IVF for about a month in Australia and he would work on the sheep and uh, so we sort of wrangled a, an invitation to get in-depth experience. So I learned a lot there, and, and Ben worked on the sheep, and you can tell them what happened to the sheep. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I could I arrive in, in Australia. Let's see, you were already there. You got there the day before I did, I guess. Maybe so, yeah. And, uh, and uh, got off the plane after a couple of fosters in the 24 hour in the air flight <laughs> and losing a day. <laughs> and uh, Alan took me straightway to operate on a 
sheep to get eggs that he had inseminated and to study the eggs and culture in vitro. And uh, that was our lead in to the uh, facilities at their veterinary school in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, it was very intense. He had, he had it so well organized. Mm -hmm. Alan Trounson, fantastic organizer and excellent scientist. So he had sheep available for us, and uh, all we had to do was inject them, get the get the eggs. We were getting them surgically, and and uh, treat the sperm as I'd already done the cow mm -hmm. before we started this, and uh, and it worked quite well. I remember we got our first cleaved eggs, and and. Uh, probably had a bottle of champagne <laughs> in Australia. And uh, so then we transferred some of these, a four cell and six cell embryo into uh, a dough that we had synchronized as far as the reproductive cycle. And uh, Jeremy Thompson came all the way from Brisbane, another part of Australia to Melbourne just to learn, you know, from us. So we had it going pretty good. The difficulty, the, the, the sheep did get pregnant, but unfortunately she didn't carry it all the way to term. And that discouraged me. And by that time we were back home and I was, had two jobs. So one you... with, one in human medicine and one in veterinary medicine in the college of veterinary medicine as department head of physiology and pharmacology. So I took all of this newfound work very seriously and put the other on a back burner. And uh, doctor, uh, people knew about it all around the world. We'd done it. And uh, Nicole Crozet came over from France and learned from us the procedure. and. My students at that time weren't able to do it. It was sort of like the M.C. Chang experience. I mean, you know, I told them exactly what to do, and I could show them as much as I could, but they were the hands carrying it out, and could have been the animals, the environment at the new, new lab in Georgia versus Australia. And uh, Anyway, Dr. Crozet learned enough to go back home and get the first lambs from in vitro fertilization in France. Unfortunately, she forgot to acknowledge us in the, uh, in the paper. <laughs> that's, but that's what so it goes. I want to tell you a story about one of the experiences we had in Australia. It, um, it's not published under our name, and we don't get any credit for it, but we were there in the room when it happened, and that was the first egg donation pregnancy in the world. Alan Transon and the team in, in, Mel in Melbourne were pushing everything. They were pushing, they were learning uh, how to freeze embryos at the time, but not, they hadn't achieved a success with freezing embryos. So uh, one of the things that was going on was that when they had patients who Sometimes some of their patients would get sort of more embryos than they needed. You didn't want to put back too many embryos in the uterus. So they would talk the patients into basically donating those eggs if they had a lot too, some more eggs than they sort of needed or sometimes the embryos. Um, so they knew that an opportunity might come up. So they would have patients who needed a donor egg prepared with some hormones based on a regimen that Alan Transon cooked up based on his extensive experience in embryo transfers in cows. He sort of guessed how much drug you would have to give humans to give them enough estrogen to make their lining ready and then how much progesterone to give them. And so one cold and rainy winter night in March, uh, ben, tell them about finding the egg. The, it was a fertilized egg. We, yeah, we had, we had followed, we were shadowing Alan Trounson because he's the genius behind the Australian effort that, that was actually headed by Carl Wood. 
in, in OBGYN. Um, and gee, Johnson was, he was a mile a minute. I mean, we'd already heard him give a seminar earlier and we'd, mm. we'd been with him since daybreak through all the different procedures. And, and so it was the end of the day and it was getting dark, kind of, and drizzling outside. And he was looking for the embryo to transfer into the patient next door in a house next to the hospital. The doctor's office. It was the doctor's office, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Leeton's office. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and he said, uh, I just can't find it, Ben. You find it. And so I looked in there, and ah, there's the embryo. And so we found it and put it in a test tube, and we had to convey it to the house next door. And uh, so I said, uh, Joe, we need to keep this warm. Uh, are you wearing jockey shorts? <laughs> he admitted he was, and he carried the embryo, incubating it all the way to the house next door through the drizzle and uh, pulled it out for Dr. Leeton to transfer and make the first success in transfer of a donated embryo into a woman with no functional ovaries. And they were able to sustain it hormonally. Interestingly, this was early in our visit. We spent a month in Australia together with, with their group. And uh, this was early in the visit, and Joe had a new test for LH, HCG. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was able to detect 13 days later that this lady was pregnant. And there was no communication with the Australians, the clinicians or the scientists. Mm -hmm. Trounson didn't say anything to us anymore about it. So, the, but then we read about it when it was published. How, how did the pregnancy the next year? Actually, she lost the pregnancy later. No, not this one. No? This was the okay. one. They had lost one previously. Okay. But this was the first live All right. baby. That, that, mm -hmm. uh, with a donated egg. Mm -hmm. Yes, it and was... had well incubated. Mm -hmm. Donated egg. <laughs> well, that's a... So they so didn't put your name on the congratulations. paper? Congratulations. Didn't put your name we on the paper? Get, no, no, no. We, no. Didn't, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have any Joe claim. Joe didn't even get acknowledged. We didn't have any claim to yeah. that one, no, but we were there and saw it, and yeah, it was the beginning of something that has yeah. turned into a very important part of our it was, armamentarium now. It was a historic well, event. It really was. I was going back to that um, sort of common sense thing of keeping it warm, like the body temperature. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like close as you um, can. I, I would like, like to add something about controversies in mold and ethics. Uh, Patrick Steptoe and Bob Edwards had their, uh, had their IVF baby in 1978. So knowing what we know, they should have received the Nobel Prize in 1982. You know? mm -hmm. But there was nothing. Patrick Steptoe passed away in 1988. I mean, obviously, we acknowledged their success and so forth, but it was not divulged to the, to the big public. Bob Edwards was finally awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2010, 32 years after the birth of Louis Brown. He was there to receive it, but he was 85, and unfortunately, he did not know where he was because he had Alzheimer. So that's a, that's a very sad story. And, sad. and then in 2011, he was knighted by the queen, still not knowing what was, <laughs> what was happening to him. And he died in, in 2013. Mm -hmm. that's, yes. But the recognition of in vitro fertilization as worthy of a Nobel Prize means a lot to all of us Yes. who devoted so much time and effort mm -hmm. to make it come to fruition. Definitely. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, that would really be about 50 years after mm -hmm. so much of this research was being done, mm -hmm. leading to that, which is, which is interesting. So, Edward, how many babies have been born from in vitro fertilization now? So, uh, in the whole world, it's five millions. 
And I mean, that's the, the recent total recent data. In the, world. Mm -hmm. the total in the whole world, about five million, and mm -hmm. uh, in, this, in, this, in this country, one million. Yeah. So someone estimated that it's 2% of births now in this country. Right. So it's. I want to um, mention that Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Carr was uh, the first IVF baby in the U.S., and she was born in 1981, and that was in the Jones uh, mm -hmm. Clinic. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, I think she was around the 19th born in the world, and that was in 81. Right. And so we think about all that 20 years leading up to that point. Um, how did her birth change the dynamic in the U.S. Uh, for doing um, IVF, um, the assumptions and beliefs of people? It seems that things sort of opened up in the sense of moving forward with um, procedures well, and technology and so on. The, uh, the Jones had moved, had already moved from Jones Hopkins to, um, to uh, Norfolk with East Virginia Medical School. So they, they started the, the Jones Institute for Reproductive Medicine. And uh, we were, uh, and I remember seeing Joe there, we, we were going just about every year to their, to their meetings. And uh, the first, first time we were, we were probably 20 of us, and mm -hmm. the second time 40, and then there was a geometric progression. But for the first uh, six or seven years, and they were sharing their knowledge, they were sharing their I remember the, you know, they had a, an embryologist, uh, Lucinda Vick, who was uh, the, there, Bob Edwards, she, and she was actually, a, she was not a PhD, she was just a technologist, but she, mm -hmm. she was a wonder, doing a wonderful job. And um, they, they had also a school of andrology. Um, anyway, um, they, they shared, uh, they shared their knowledge, uh, and they were very uh, graceful. They were in, inviting us. We, I went there, spent spent a few days. Uh, my technologist went there, spent a few days. My nurse in the my nurses did too. In so '84. It, it was 1985. Five. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, it was becoming more and more. Yeah, I mean, we started in '83, and that was pretty early in the South, but. Vanderbilt had <coughs> IVF going. Um, I'm not sure anybody else in the Deep South had it. When, uh -uh. When in we in 1985, going. there was a meeting in Carmel, California. It was an uh, ACOG meeting, that uh, OBGYN meeting was uh, mm -hmm. taking place. The world OBGYN meeting was taking place in San Francisco. And there was a side meeting in Carmel. And the Jones were presenting their first 10 test tube baby. And there was uh, Dr. Quigley from Texas, we had one, and Dr. Richard Moss from, um, from US UCLA, from Los Angeles, who had uh, two or three. So anyway, there's a, an anecdote here. Um, recently, I had a patient, uh, it was probably four or five years ago, who came to see me, and she needed in vitro fertilization. And she told me, you know, I'm a, I'm a test tube baby myself. I said, really? I said, where were you born? She said, uh, Los Angeles. And I looked at her birth date, and she said, it was 1983. I said, I bet your, your mother's doctor was Dr. Richard Moss. How did you know? Because <laughs> <laughs> he was the only one. Because he was the one that did it. <laughs> and, and anyway, so it was interesting, because obviously now she has uh, three, three daughters from IVF. <laughs> And she was an IVF baby herself. Yeah. Can can I back up a few years? Yeah. Again, yeah. Let's do <laughs> Again, I'm I'm, let's I'm, do I'm, I'm backwards. Um, <laughs> well, that's but, uh, that's the, you're the you're the, but, the great pioneer here. But in <laughs> in this country before before the Joneses before uh, success with human in vitro fertilization, we had we talked about the ethical concerns. Uh, this led me to, I was very sympathetic with Pierre Supar and, mm -hmm. and his frustration by not getting support to continue human work. But the writing was on the wall and the ethics, the climate was such that as a veterinarian, I couldn't be too frustrated because there were so many other important things to do. And 
1974, I switched my major and minor appointments from OBGYN Human Medical School to the Veterinary School and became professor of animal reproduction at New Bolton Center, University of Pennsylvania, and focused on the cow to develop the technology. And I learned of the, uh, the event in England, the pregnancy, by Bob Brown, ABC News, came to my lab and said, you know, he, he thought I would know all about it, but I didn't know anything. <laughs> and it was just about a month or two away. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, uh, he wanted to know about what we were doing and the cow. And so uh, he wanted me to let him know when the calf was born. And that was in 1981, but it was six months before the Joneses got the human baby. And that was fortunate because that brought more attention to what we did mm -hmm. at New Bolton Center and the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so they had said that they were interested. And so when the, when the calf was coming, we called them up and uh, they, the people on the farm where, where the first test tube calf was born did a big X in the cornfield so the helicopters from New York could know where to mm -hmm. land near the barn where the cow was having the calf. So it wow. was, it, all of that excitement was there. And uh, the interesting thing, that was the world's first test tube calf. But today we talked about the number of human IVF babies. Worldwide, there are between a half and three quarters million calves born every year from in vitro fertilization mm -hmm. around the world. And the leaders are Japan and Brazil, uh, South America, and uh, here in the United States, it's all over. So, so it's become it became ru almost routine? Or almost commonplace for elite, the elite cattle. Elite cows. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and in South America, cattle, the procedure is easier because their eggs, you can recover as many eggs without superovulation, or without hormonal treatment. And there are things that we've learned through the years that made it take off. So that's... Yeah, so, yeah, so in vitro fertilization has indeed taken off in humans. I mean, the success rate now... Yeah. And, Patients around age 36 is 40 percent, not 15 percent. So it's much more successful. And there are complementary technologies. Embryo and freezing now works. Egg freezing yeah. now works. And I think uh, before we get into that, we'll take a break. Okay. And uh, come back because what I'll do is is probably we're going to take a break now for lunch. Okay. I'll. I'll I, pick can, up. I can show for the oh fantastic the success rate of our in 2014. Yes, okay. yes that would be yeah. great. Um, we'll come back and with Elizabeth Carr's birth, and uh, I've got a little quote from the New York Times when she was born about what was going on in the country at that time. But then um, start with all the next like the next 35 years was just a parade of new technology and mm -hmm. procedures and IVF and and alternatives and so on. And we'll go through that and then we'll get to what the practice looks like today and okay. the legal a aspects. Okay. And that. So when Elizabeth Carr was born in 1981 and she was the first live IVF birth in the United States, according to the New York Times at that time, at least five American clinics were testing infertile women in this way and so far with meager success. Nevertheless, reliability seems to be improving rapidly. The time when it becomes standard treatment for several causes of infertility may be drawing near. And it seems that, indeed, in the next 35 years, from like 1981 to 2016, there was a parade of new technologies and procedures in IVF and even in its alternatives. So what do you think were the most significant advances in making IVF common? and uh, an accepted method of human reproduction during that era? Well, 
I've got two things that come to my mind. First, the, the growth to the blastocyst stage, because all the first transfers were done, uh, there were early transfers, the f uh, two or three days after fertilization. In other words, the embryo has less than that eight, a maximum of eight cells. And uh, going to the blastocyst was when, the, 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 when we were able to grow the embryo to the blastocyst stage, we were able to, to implant an embryo at the stage when it was reaching the uterus in vivo. And the other great breakthrough was the intracytoplasmic sperm injection, when, they, when we were able to uh, create an individual just with one sperm and one, <coughs> one egg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, the last one, the ICSI, we call it intracytoplasmic sperm injection, opened up in vitro to men who had extremely low sperm counts. Before that, if the sperm were terribly low, like 1% of normal, you got poor fertilization, but with the techniques that the Belgians developed, and actually our center in Atlanta was the first in the country to get a ICSI pregnancy, um, there was all of a sudden now, uh, it doesn't matter how many sperm the man has, if he has nine sperm, that's enough for nine eggs, that's, that's all he needs. So that's huge. But going early, even earlier uh, than that, I would argue that some, if you remember, I'm sure Ben remembers, when we made media in 1983, we had to get a Mettler balance and get the salts and put them out and measure them every single yeah. aliquot of media. Now there's standard media, it's commercial. We went through years of not knowing which was the right media, you know, which media you use and which media you use, and that's all sort of been homogenized. And even when you had the right medium, we, we had to do quality control. Right. And so we, were using, we were using mouse embryos yeah. or mm -hmm. bovine embryos to check our, our medium mm -hmm. to make sure that they were, they were not killing our, our cells. So the conditions have gotten a lot more even, I guess. Uh, people have learned from each other. Uh, the general, general success is now 40% instead of 15%. Of course, age influences that, but uh, that's a huge development. And then uh, I think an egg donation, which started in Australia with that one case, is now 10% of all IVF pregnancies are now from egg donation. So an egg donation is not just for women who are in menopause, it's for women who are born without ovaries or have their ovaries removed or sort of have premature aging of the ovaries and have poor success rates with IVF. Let's just say a 38-year-old who fails IVF three times with her own eggs, uh, sometimes the right thing for her to do is not try it again, but to have an egg donor. And it, it, there's some reasons why that fits certain people. But egg donation is widely available and, and uh, part of that now, the new paradigm for that is egg banking. Uh, we're, uh, we used to not be able to freeze eggs. That came along. When do we? We had the first success for that in the United States and in Atlanta as well. But the procedure we used was slow freezing, and now there's something called vitrification, which is rapid freezing, which is much better. So egg freezing has made egg banking possible, and it lowers the cost of egg donation, so it's more available. Um, egg donation is universally applied as an option, so that's been a big advance. And, and then you have the pre-implantation genetic screening. Mm, mm -hmm. And pre-implantation genetic uh, um, PGD, mm -hmm. PGS screening and PGD, mm -hmm. um, uh, which, which, which detects the, the genes. So that's, that has been also a huge, a huge advance. Now we maybe should go into the details of all that. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting. Uh, I, I can start with the uh, with the blastocyst. Um, the when the egg and the sperm meet usually in the distal, which the ampullary portion of the of the fallopian tubes at the end of the tube, and that's where fertilization takes place, and that happens 
And uh, within four days, the, the, the embryo travels into the fallopian tubes, and it, it comes, it, it, it drops into the uterine cavity on day five. So before, uh, before, uh, before 1988 or 1990, uh, all the transfers were done on the third day of, uh, after fertilization. Mm -hmm. And even now, there are a lot of centers that just do day three transfers, day two transfers. Anyway, uh, it's one of my, my consultant, my, my friend and consultant, uh, Yves Menezo, who started to do embryo transfers at the blastocyst stage. And to do so, the, the, media, the media were able to, able to support the, the life of the embryos until day three. And he, he came up with, a, with an idea. He was, he was uh, making cultures. Uh, they, they were calling that feeder cells in, in co-culture. They were in, on a petri dish of, uh, of tubal cells, tubal cells or endometrial cells. And after day three, we were placing the embryos of the, the day three, we were placing them on, the, on those co-culture dishes and they could grow to the blastocyst stage. And then we could uh, do the, the transfer on day five, which is on, we put the blastocyst in the uterus when it's supposed to, to, to come into the uterus and it's going to hatch. In fact, we, some of them were, were hatching at the time we were placing them there. So that improved uh, things tremendously. Now it, make, it made things much more complex, complicated for the for the technician in the lab, because you had to prepare the dishes, it was very complicated. Anyway, we had uh, three schools. It was uh, Paris with Dr. Menezo, uh, Barcelona with Dr. Vega, Anna Vega, and, and us in Augusta. And we put together 200 cases. And when we presented that in, uh, at the Fertility Society uh, meeting in Montreal in 19... 91, and I, I think nobody knew what we were talking about. But now it's, uh, it's something that uh, everybody does. I mean, mm -hmm. all the best centers do. The co-culture situa co uh, uh, was, was very complex. And uh, um, a few years later, uh, got Dr. Gardner uh, developed, developed media that were uh, containing the ingredients that those culture cells were providing. And they were, call, call, they call, they were calling them uh, complex media. So now we lose complex media. We don't do co-culture anymore. And we, we go our embryos to the blastocyst stage for the transfer with complex media. I could add some animal experiments to this. Okay. They didn't call it ICSI, but they called it sperm penetration. We did some in the lab. What year was that? UGA. 76? In 76. Mm. Uh, that was way ahead of, of us then. And then uh, <coughs> we did some at our lab at the University of Georgia, which is sperm injection. One of the experiments involved hamster eggs and uh, injection of bull sperm and they form pronuclei, which indicated that there is not a species specificity in the effect of the egg on the sperm to go ahead and do what it's supposed to do, at least to initiate fertilization. And we carried it further with uh, goat ICSI, <laughs> and that was actually in collaboration with the talented group at uh, Reproductive Biology Associates. I had left RBA by that time, but we still <coughs> maintain a good uh, collaboration through the years. And uh, also in cow eggs. And the most recent work uh, by uh, one of my students, Turkish a veterinarian who came and got his PhD with me and then went to work for Dr. Servi, mm -hmm. Levent Cuscandepi. Our last experiments involved freeze-dried bull sperm 
with injection into eggs to make blastocysts in vitro. And uh, that's about as far as we carried that technology. But a lot of these things have been done in animals and and elevated yeah. to human clinical where, practice. Where we, we didn't believe before 1981, 1991 that injecting a human sperm in a human egg would cause an, an embryo. And what is interesting is that uh, in our first andrology uh, courses, uh, you, we had to have capacitation, which means the, the sperm had to be traveling first from the testicle where it's immobile into the ejaculatory ducts, then go into the female genital tract to, to obtain what its quality of capacitation. And there was also something called the acrosome reaction. When the sperm act arrives on the shell, on the zona, and has to penetrate. And they, they were thinking that you had to have uh, 200 or, I mean, 200 to 1,000 sperm helping, sending their enzymes to help that particular sperm to penetrate. And then after that, there, was to, uh, there had to be the fusion. And so they, they developed, uh, you know, a lot of things were developed to bypass the capacitation. We, we managed to bypass the capacitation by placing the, um, the, the sperm into a physiologic medium and letting, letting, let, let it incubate. And we mm -hmm. bypass the, the acrosome, acrosome reaction by injecting the sperm past, past the, the zona. And we were placing, a, and I think it was one of the colleagues of RBA, yeah. the Jacques Cohen, who was putting the sperm just uh, past the zona. He was calling that the SUSI, the subzonal insertion. Sperm injection. Yeah. And what happened, uh, it's, it's serendipity, really, and hazard, that happened in Brussels a fellow by the name of, an Italian fellow by the name of John Piero Palermo uh, was, uh, I mean, the story was, was told to me that way. He, uh, one night he was doing a, a Susie, <laughs> he was trying to, uh, somehow this needle slipped and went into the, the cytoplasm in the, inside the egg. And the sperm, instead of release, being released behind the, behind the shell, went into the cytoplasm. And the next day, Eureka, if, <laughs> there were two pronuclei showing that there was fertilization. So anyway, uh, John Piero Palermo became uh, very famous. Now he's now, uh, he was now a professor. He became an MD because he went, into, he took, he took his, uh, he went back to medical, to medical school in New York. And he's, he's a teacher of embryology uh, at Cornell. Anyway, uh, we, we know that he's the real author of, uh, of the real pioneer of ICSI, but the, the Belgian school uh, yeah. debates that. Uh, the, the two, the, they say that uh, it happened in Belgium and they are, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a Belgian inno innovation. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a reasonable thing to think of doing, injecting sperm with yeah. micro manipulation people that become adept at that. Uh, I'll back up a few years to 1969. We found, uh, you mentioned the uh, capacitation and the sperm acrosome reaction. We found at the University of Pennsylvania that the enzymes in the acrosome were trypsin-like to digest the sperm's way through the zona pellucida of the egg, the outer shell of the egg. And uh, we could inhibit that with inhibitors of trypsin enzyme. And the group that I left here at Un University of Georgia, led by Dr. Williams, did similar work. And actually, Dr. Williams named the sperm enzyme acrosin, acrosin mm -hmm. the one that digests the sperm into mm -hmm. the egg fertilization. And uh, then subsequent air experiments, it's interesting that I guess there's some communication on some level. It may be mental telepathy, <laughs> and it may be just common, you know, what would normally come to your mind about sperm injection. Uh, 
in assessing sperm fertilizing ability, Dr. Yanagamachi is credited with the best means involving hamster eggs with the zona pellucida removed and subjected to sperm of any species, human, cow, bull, anything. And, and they interact to form a pronucleus. And uh, that was commonly used for a number of years. I don't know whether it still is at all. But. Yeah, well, that was a test of the fertilizing ability of the sperm came from that work. And it sort of fell by the wayside as not reliable enough. And it's difficult. You've got to maintain <clears throat> hamsters. You know, right. So all these labs. we did that for, tried it for a couple of years, but it, yeah. it was before ICSI, and now we don't worry about it. Right. If the man's sperm mm -hmm. is bad, as long as you got nine <laughs> live sperm, that's all you need. This was a big, a big topic in 1986. The World Health Organization held a, a workshop, work session, and uh, there were about, I don't know, I guess about nine of us from around the world at that meeting in Geneva to come up to present what we thought was the best way for assessing sperm fertilizing ability. And uh, I had electron mic microscopy of sperm to show all the, how bad they look <laughs> and, and the miracle of ever getting one into an egg to begin with. And uh, Yanagamachi, of course, with the Zona Free Hamster, Steptoe was at that meeting, Patrick Steptoe, and that was when I met him in 1986. Mm -hmm. And he glibly told me several times that when we get good eggs, we get fertilization, capacitation, no big deal. Yeah. And uh, that was 86. But already, we had spent about 10 years of my life trying to figure out how to do that in vitro, apart from the rabbit uterus, for rabbit in vitro capacitation. And what we found, Gene Alfin, you remember Gene postdoc, uh, and I came up with adding salt to the medium. Mm -hmm. And with high salt medium, salted off the components of seminal plasma that prevent the sperm from fertilizing. And we found subsequently that we could just incubate the sperm and in the same similar, very similar medium that I originally came up with for fertilization. And just by incubation, it would enable capacitation to take place. And we didn't publish that until about 1982 in memory of Pierre Supar mm -hmm. in Journal of Andrology. But these barriers to development of in vitro fertilization Many of them we addressed along the way. Yeah. And we had some common experiments that were, you know, just moved on out into common practice. On the clinical side, we learned a lot too. Um, we learned that we could give bigger doses of drugs and get away with it. Mm -hmm. And we, the, at first we were, there was this, there's a syndrome called hyperstimulation. And we were, if you give too much hyperstimulant, too much drug, some of the patients will get sick. They'll get big ovaries and flu in their belly, and you have to, it's a complicated problem that you'd like to avoid. So we were leery of giving too much drug, number one. We were worried about the cost of the drug. Uh, but we now have learned that we can push the drug doses higher and get more eggs. I remember th seeing a, Howard Jones give a presentation uh, early on after we just started and with and I said wow they get an average of six eggs on a case I thought that would be great if we could get six eggs a case because <laughs> we were getting three and four and, and every egg really counts now an average number of eggs is about nine we've learned not to one of the things that it's been very incremental at first we didn't have a good way of preventing patients from ovulating before we were ready and we had to do a lot of tricks to time ovulation. I won't get into all of that, but now we have a drug that keeps the ladies from ovulating 
when we're not ready so we can trigger ovulation and get the get that right every single time um, we've learned to supplement the luteal phase better uh, so it's just been incremental steps I wanted to ask how much um, interaction did you have between the drug companies and the um, you know the practices in, in developing drugs that would um, move things forward well, I mean, I credit the drug companies to some extent, although actually the the first LA, the, the first ovulation prevention drug, called, uh, it's called Lupron, the drug companies didn't help a bit, okay? They just sell us the drug off indications. So they never really contributed to that at all. The, the company that's making the money off of it didn't do anything. Uh, on the other hand, there's another drug group called Antagonist, and the drug companies did tailor those for our use, and you have to give them credit for that. They had to put a lot of money into it. So generally speaking, I think the drug companies in our field have had this sort of this niche, and they have done a good job of supporting research in the field. Um, so it's been a good partnership. Well, I think my understanding is that in the high cost of IVF has been, a lot of that high cost has been in paying for the drugs, is yeah. that not so? Yeah, they haven't been helpful that way. They haven't mm -hmm. cut the price as much as we'd like. Yeah. So sometimes we try to come up with protocols to cut the n amount of drugs, and, and we've done that to some extent. The, co the cost is much, much higher in this country for some reason. I mean, we probably know it's probably because of the legal aspect of the qualification of a drug much higher here than in Mexico, Canada, or, or in Europe. Because they can get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reason. So and some, some of the patients go get their drug in, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. but, um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a problem. Um, now, one of the drug companies, uh, which is it, Serono now, there's a, has a compa compassionate care program mm -hmm. where they, if, if you send uh, your, your income tax uh, <laughs> and uh, receipt and uh, all, uh, they can give you discounts. So mm -hmm. they, give, they give a discount that are well, as that high as 75% for the militaries. Yeah, that's which true. Which is very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I have a fair number of patients who I take it back. They have, they will cut it if your if your income is below a certain level. I've had patients get seventy five percent off, so that's a huge help for them. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people, more and more people are seeing this as valuable. People, let's just say, who are working on an hourly wage, uh, coming up with ten thousand dollars, or mm -hmm. in some cases, way more than that, is a mm -hmm. they have to save up for it. The, the so, average cost of IVF in this country is between fifteen and eighteen thousand dollars, but uh, and including the medicine. But uh, our friend here, Dr. Massey, came up with a low cost program, and he converted me into into the low cost program. Tell, tell us about. So, it. yeah. So our co the cost to our patients is more on the order of about eleven thousand currently, instead of as high as. We, we save them five or six thousand dollars. Yeah, mm -hmm. we save them that. So we just do the full, do the do IVF and don't charge as much. And I learned that from Dr. Kiltz up in New York. You can, we can do it for less and do the, and do a good job. I was talking with a friend just this week and talking about this interview coming up, and she had IVF for her child, and mm -hmm. she said. Um, it cost us twenty thousand dollars, and she said we knew that this we had one shot at it, and she mm -hmm. said so. She's really a miracle baby. So and, it worked uh, for her. It yeah. worked for her. Yeah, that's but tough. But it was twenty thousand yeah. dollars. It doesn't have to be <laughs> that high. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, but but it's complicated because yeah, we can't mm -hmm. solve that for everybody, but we solved it for our patients. So. To some extent, but it's still ten thousand dollars or eleven thousand dollars is still a lot of money. Yeah. Now, in in our in our program, everything is included. In other words, if the patients have ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or assisted hatching, all those little mm -hmm. things that are, that come along, we don't we don't add any any cost to that. 
Yeah. Now, if they have a pre-implantation genetic screening or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, uh, that the lab will have a fairly significant cost. One of the other things that we didn't talk about it in, in any depth is is embryo freezing, which mm -hmm. I mentioned uh, the Australians pioneered in 1983. That's routine now for, I would say, 30, maybe 40 percent of our patients mm -hmm. have more embryos than they want to put back, uh, than they should put back. So they can put back, let's just say, two embryos, mm -hmm. and if they don't get pregnant, they have a, another one to put back. Um, so it's another, you get another try for, I'm going to just in, in round numbers, like $3,500 instead of the whole thing all over again. Another advance that we've made in, since IVF has gotten to be more efficient is we're putting back less embryos. And we haven't really talked about that, but one of our problems is that we create multiple pregnancies. So... What we've learned is just about don't put three embryos back anymore. So the pregnancy, so years ago, 5% of IVF pregnancies wound up as triplets. Triplets are always premature. Three three-pound babies is not what you came to the doctor to get. And they're in intensive care, and some of them are going to have long-term problems. So... Uh, we've reduced that nationally down so that uh, it's un way under 1% triplets now. I can't remember exactly, but we just really, really try to avoid yeah, putting yeah, three yeah. embryos back. And yeah. the, now yeah. the emphasis is to cut the twin r risk down, twin uh, rates down. So younger patients, 27-year-olds, shouldn't be putting two embryos back even. They should put them back one at a time and avoid twins because twins are are very risky compared to a singleton. So that's it's not an advance in the in the pregnancy rate. It's the same number of people getting pregnant and it's slower but it's safer. So we've learned a lot there. I think the key to this is the improvement in the quality of the embryos. Right. When this began in England, I remember uh, in the early eight, 1980, around 1980, Bob Edwards was touting, put in all as many embryos as you could because they have a helper effect. Mm -hmm. So you put in three or four embryos, yeah. you're more likely to get a pregnancy. And so we had just succeeded with the cow and had our first calf and we said, well, let's see if he's right. And so we hmm. took a couple of recipients. We put two embryos in this one and two embryos in this one. We got four calves. <laughs> <laughs> Each of them bore twin calves. By C-section. By, by 1984. No, they delivered, they delivered normal, normal, normal deliveries. But calving, twinning in cows is, is as in people about the same low incidence is normal. Com going back to the freezing, uh, we started uh, freezing very early. And th there was a method called the slow freezing, which was very complex and, and slow and uh, very uh, dis difficult for the, for the lab. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we had a 10% to 15% success rate. I mean, the, the frozen thawed embryos were, it was not that successful. And more recently, also since we, we were freezing blastocysts, we were able to, to do vitrification. And with our program now, the freezing, the freezing thawing program is just as successful, if not more successful, than the fresh transfers. We have, uh, mm -hmm. we have something like a 60 or 70 percent <coughs> success rate with our frozen thawed embryos. So that's a, that's a huge improvement also. I remember when freezing started with uh, Lebo Mazer uh, in at Oak Ridge. They froze mouse embryos the slow freezing way, and that was about 1972, if I remember, around early 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stan Lebo, uh, we invited him to our lab in Pennsylvania and started trying to freeze the rabbit embryos. 
and it was such a hassle. We had to get all this, all this equipment, and we we geared up for it, and we finally gave it up. But we did, you know, we got into it a bit. But interesting thing from this, Whittingham was the other author on that. Whittingham in 1972, I think it was was the first to freeze the mouse embryo and transfer it mm -hmm. to get mice. And uh, these, this was really a breakthrough, mm -hmm. I mean, to freeze mammalian embryos. That was very, very good. But it's every day now, so we've, every come, day. we've come a long way. But the, so. the advance over that is I'm impressed with how oocytes, the human oocyte freezing mm -hmm. is just routine, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not quite as far advanced in the cow as well, people, but they, right? they can do it, but so, it's so, not so, in practice as something much. In, something interesting is that uh, in Europe, uh, different countries have different laws mm -hmm. in co controlling IVF, and in Italy, in Italy, there, were, uh, there was a law saying that you could not fertilize more than two oocytes. So they were retrieving because they didn't want to have frozen embryos in the, in the lab, mm -hmm. in the containers. So the, the, the Italians became very good in freezing oocytes, freezing mm -hmm. the, extra, <laughs> the extra eggs, mm -hmm. so, which makes that they were ahead of all of us because they were very good in doing the vitrification of the oocytes, mm -hmm. which makes that when we when we wanted to have to start our oocyte freezing program in in Augusta, with the, in the Survey Massey Fertility Center, I called one of our friends, who used to work with Joe, and I won't tell his name, um, and I said, you know, uh, can you can you help us? You know, I'd like for you to come and show show our techno technologist. Say, well, I have a contract with such a group from Maryland, and uh, I cannot do that because I signed papers and I cannot divulge the secret. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So anyway, I called uh, our friends in Europe, and they sent me, they sent to us a, a technologist from it Italy, a young, nice, sweet young lady who came and taught our technologists how to freeze the oocytes, and we mm -hmm. we have the best o oocyte freezing program now. Oh, that's a good. In, in Augusta. It's amazing. Oh, yep, so that's been a good contribution, particularly for egg, for egg donation. And also that removes one of the ethical concerns about how do we treat human embryos. If you can freeze sperm, you can freeze eggs, then it's, it's not really quite yeah. the problem. Right. Well, was originally. We have patients who object to have frozen eggs in the bank. Frozen embryos. You know. for, uh, embryos. Frozen, excuse me, to have frozen mm. embryos. Mm -hmm. in the, so what I tell them, I say, look, we're going to, to retrieve the eggs. We're going to, to freeze, to, um, uh, to uh, fertilize two of them or three of them, and we'll transfer them. And the rest of the oocyte, we'll, we'll freeze them. So people who have that problem, we can, we can satisfy mm -hmm. them. Right. One thing I'd like to switch to is talking a little bit about um, how the medical practice looks today. And um, in 2013, RBA, as we mentioned before, they were celebrating their 30th year and 30,000 babies. Uh, they had a big party at the Atlanta Zoo with um, mm -hmm their IV, IVF families came back for this reunion. And um, Dr. Serby, do you know how many babies of births you've had through IVF at your uh, clinic? Uh, I, don't, I don't, you know, compared to RBA, we are a very small, mm -hmm. small place. So I would say maybe um, at this time we're probably just reaching um, 800 or something like that. So I don't think they've had 30,000 babies from IVF. <clears throat> I think it's from all their infertility treatments. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people get pregnant from insemination mm -hmm. before they do IVF. So I'm going to guess half of those were If you talk about, about, uh, if you talk about uh, infertility 
Yeah, all and their and they would have probably five their, or six thousand from yeah. their clinic. Yeah, so anyway, but yeah, it's big numbers now. Well, I want to talk about the practice in that respect. You know, what are what do you see as the demographics of your patients today? And um, we've talked a little bit um, outside of here about uh, medical tourism, because you do have people coming from other countries, and medical tourism is is really a, something that's new, but it's, it's not just for infertility, it's for other diseases as well. People may be traveling to get what they think is the best help you know, to take care of something. And um, a little bit too about you know, this is a very difficult process for your patient to go through, and it affects not only your patient, but the broader family as well. And so some, some things you've observed over the years and, and trying to help your patients through what is a very difficult and it can be a very frustrating, and then too, it can be a very happy, happy experience. Well, um, Joe, we'll, we'll talk about the patient coming from other countries mm -hmm. to Atlanta and other stuff to to have IVF, but I can say that also there are uh, American patients who actually go to Europe to have IVF mm -hmm. because of the cost. Mm -hmm. So with our low cost, we compete with them because when they, when they add the travel, the, tra the travel, the, the, mm -hmm. the plane ticket and the, and the IVF in, in Czechoslovakia, or I mean, as we say, the, in Czechia or, mm -hmm. or Hungar Hungary, uh, we we can we can compete with those with our low cost program, but otherwise the they can get IVF uh, having practicing tourism in in Central Europe and, and as a matter of fact, when I was looking up IVF on on I was googling and doing some various things preparing for this and uh, what I said like IVF in Georgia and what. You know, popped up was Georgia overseas, and it was um, actually um, advertising like for tourism. Mm -hmm. So there were things to do mm -hmm. while you were there. Mm -hmm. So they actually had you know, like tours you could take and things of that nature. But they also promoted their clinic and how up to date it was and so on. Exactly. And so, forth. so I have a clinic in Georgia that's a provide that I visited two summers ago. And they provide eggs for some of my patients who want to save money on egg donation. So just for example, the cost of egg donation uh, for with an egg bank that I mentioned before in this country might be $20,000 or $19,000 or 18 to 20 for six eggs. And in Georgia, you can have embryos created and the embryos shipped here, so I've reversed tourism, what we do is we ship the sperm to Georgia, okay, <laughs> and the embryos back, okay, and the patient winds up with the embryos produced from 12 eggs for roughly the same price. So they have a world traveler So it's born. A, it's, it's a new concept. <laughs> You didn't know about that, did you? The, the, the well, I, we should, we I should give a little them, from We should give them some Nosh. frequent flyer. Oh, did he tell you about that's it? That's correct. <laughs> frequent <laughs> flyer in Mars no, so, before, but, before they are born. But, but right. more, more commonly, people come here because they're in a country that doesn't provide good service. Low pregnancy mm -hmm. rates, I'm going to just uh, uh, say from some third world countries, uh, it's hard for people on the, that who live on that economy to come to the United States and get even our low-cost program. But we have some patients coming, for example, from Africa because they're in their hometowns or cities. They're not getting what they think is good service and good pregnancy rates. Uh, some people come here from other countries because we the United States is more open to let's say alternative. Uh, procedures like gestational carriers and egg donation for that matter. So some countries egg donation is restricted. Uh, in Europe, it's hard to get egg donation in France. People go to Spain. They don't really need to come all the way to the United States to get egg donation. So Spain has gotten to be a world center for egg donation, or at least a big European center. Uh, 
there's not so much tourism here from Europe, I would say, uh, no. just because our prices are problematic. But for people who need just need gestational carriers, uh, sometimes it's more uh, open here. A specific example of that is gay couples. So gay couples in Europe have a hard time getting surrogacy. That in in Eastern Europe, you can't. Russia, Georgia, Ukraine. I know specifically, you have if you have need a gestational carrier, you must be married, a heterosexual couple. Um, those countries are pretty. You think you don't think they? You wouldn't think so, but but they're pretty conservative actually in some ways. Uh, they are. The religion is Orthodox Catholic. Uh, sort of, and it's become part of the political system, so the the, the government is has g become pretty restrictive. So uh, surrogacy people need to, need to travel, people needing surrogacy need to travel in the U.S. is a good destination for that. It's not a huge number of people, but it's, it's, uh, it's a steady group of people. They tend to go to the big cities like New York, San Francisco, but we get some of them in Atlanta. I believe, um, Dr. Serby, you are now a consultant for an IVF in the Congo. Oh, right. That oh. came out of this. Um. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, one of, one of our uh, patients who, whose sister came to have IVF in uh, in the Survey Massey Fertility Institute, uh, ended up in uh, Georgia. And, uh, and um, uh, the, 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 the man who was with her was one of the son of uh, a mini foreign minister from of, of Congo. And uh, anyway, he came to talk to me and told me that uh, they, they had a dire need in this kind of service in. Uh, and that was the Congo, the Republic of Congo, Brazzaville. So I said, well, uh, you know, you, maybe, maybe you don't know what, uh, what it consists of. And I invited him to visit the lab. So he came back one day and I showed him the, the old incubator, the microscope, the laminar flow hood, the operating room, the tanks, and so forth. So and anyway, they insisted. They wanted they want a, a center in, in Congo. So they asked me to be the senior medical consultant in their program. And uh, I designed a, I've got, I've got great experience in designing <laughs> labs and, and clinics. So I told them what I need. And so right now it's in, it's in the architectural, architect hands and the uh, constructors. And I think the, most of the, a lot of material will be coming out of, of Georgia. But I don't think they're going to be opening before 2019, probably. So how are the doctors are going to learn how to do egg retrievals? Well, they're, they're going to come here. Oh, they're going they're to come go, here and going, you're going to teach them? Okay. Going, we're going to teach them. Okay. Uh, we're probably going to help them the first uh, two or three weeks or first months. Yeah, and, over there. And, yeah. and uh, we're going to train uh, their doctors and their... Um, uh, it's and, not hard. And te it's technicians to, mm -hmm. to, to work. So the, co the, co the other complexity in, in that situation is to keep uh, uh, records in very good order. Right. So when you freeze embryos, you need to be able to, to, to find them and to know exactly where they come from. So they have to learn a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, not only the, the, the technique, the technology, but also the administration administration of because there is a very high demand over there for this pro, for this uh, service let's talk a little bit about legal and ethical issues now and um, because as as things evolve over time those issues change over time too with what what has um, what has come from all the fruits of this research and everything so Let's talk a little bit about surrogacy and gender selection and some other things that are at play today that you're having to deal with in your practice. Not only having to deal with, but want to deal with, perhaps, and or might have barriers uh, with legislation. 
And I know, Dr. Massey, you have been very involved with Resolve, the National mm -hmm. Infertility Association, which is sort of a grassroots advocacy group for people, for infertile couples. Mm -hmm. And um, something I've <clears throat> read about that was has to do currently today is parenthood legislation. And um, I think that would be very interesting also for us to have to touch on that. Well, do you want to start with the hardest one first? That was the last one. <laughs> I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> okay. The hardest one is uh, I'm going to just say the religious right mm -hmm. wants to make some of this difficult by declaring that life begins at conception and then trying to pass laws that would make it uh, very awkward to do what we do because, for example, some embryos die or are discarded for various reasons. And let's just say, we actually, they're, they're non-viable. Just to give you an example, we just make decisions that embryos are non-viable, right? They only they arrest at a certain stage of development and two days later they're still not developing. Dr. Brackett can look at him and tell you that it's never going to be a baby, but what if some lawyer or legislator wants to tell you that somebody else wants to look at those embryos to decide if they can just be discarded because they're non-viable? Are they going to pass a law that says we can't decide that? Uh, what are they going to? Where where is it going to stop if they start declaring that an, that that there's a that an embryo can't be, that, that if you destroy an embryo, it's murder, okay? Those are the kinds of laws that, that, that are trying to be passed. And typically, so, so the truth is what happens is the infertility clinics in the state hire a lobbyist to go and try to convince reasonable-minded legislators that this really isn't a healthy thing to try to pass eventually it would get overturned by the Supreme Court because we have reproductive rights in this country that would make those laws not workable. But still, you'd have to fight about it for a couple of years. It would have a huge cost. So um, so that it comes up every year in Georgia. Um, and we have a lobbyist who basically quietly <laughs> tries to keep it from going past committee hearings. But we have to send people down there to testify about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's really unhelpful. Um, it's hard for me to imagine why some, usually male, legislators want to impose this on women. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's kind of upsetting, but uh, it's, that's what that's all about, these parenthood. Parenthood, uh, what is it called? Person. Personhood, the personhood. Did I say parenthood? Personhood, person, personhood laws declaring an embryo a person at conception. You know these these arguments were were viable back in 1970. Yeah, and, it's the same uh, thinking. And we, you know, these they had hearings all around the country about when does life begin and this sort of thing, and I usually just kind of pushed it aside because we had more important things to do in the lab, you know, to get on with it. But but it's it's re the reason for that is that it's a trivial consideration because life is continuous. It's a continuum. The sperm is alive, the egg is alive, mm -hmm. the embryo is alive, and if the embryo has the appropriate DNA and genetics to carry on and finds the right environment, then it can make a baby, but that's 30% of the embryos normally in human fertility. At best, that's, right. That's where the, uh, and in cattle as well. It's, it's, not, it's not even 40%, 30%, it's, it's 50% of the, the, the embryos, and I'm going to show you this figure, 50% oh, of the embryo in a, in a young person, less than 35 year old, that are abnormal. So, anyway, I just want to, to bring and up... And they die to, and to, yeah, don't just, develop. Right. Yeah. 
But uh, they are abnormal because they have abnormal an extra chromosome, a missing right, chromosome. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Major chromosomal problems. So um, I want to bring another indication for, mm -hmm. the, for in vitro fertilization is those young couples who have habitual first trimester abortion, first trimester miscarriages. They, they get pregnant, they, have, they are not infertile. Uh, they, have, uh, they go to, to six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, or nine weeks of pregnancy, and then they, they miscarry. And we have, uh, lately, we have had a, a good number of patients like this. I mean, I've, I've got at least 10 that came, and we do a workup, uh, we try to find out if there is a problem inside the uterus, if, uh, if there is a, 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 an enzyme, a deficient uh, enzyme, if there are antibodies that are fighting the fetus, and no, we don't find anything. And what, and what I'm going to give you an, ex an example, uh, we had a patient like this, and she, in fact, she had, five, she had been pregnant five times and had lost everything. And we did, we said, well, let's, let's do in vitro fertilization. And we did um, PGS, pre-implantation genetic screening, and we found that a person, out of eight embryos, she had only one normal. All the others were qu what we call uh, aneuploid, which means that they had an extra chromosome, a missing chromosome. And we transferred the normal emb embryo, they have, a, they have a child now. So that's an indication for habitual first trimester miscarriage, for repeat fetal loss when mm -hmm. it, it comes back. So, um, and that's, that's important. And that's when uh, we, we, there are several specialized uh, labs in this country that do, that, uh, that, do the, that do the karyotype on three cells. So we, the, take three cells out of the blastocyst and send them to the lab. And those labs have done their statistics. And that's a statistic that we have. Uh, it shows that uh, at the age of fo past 40 years old, 86% of the embryos are abnormal. Now, if the person is less than 35 years old, it's 50% 50, 50 of the embryos that are abnormal. So that's... Uh, that's, that's very significant. Mm, I need that chart. Yeah, that's <laughs> chart. And uh, yeah. that was given to us by Genesis. Yeah. And uh, I showed that to the patient because, you know, they think uh, we have a lot of patients who are uh, 38 and older. You know, mm -hmm. And I have to tell them, I said, you know, your, your chances are not as high to conceive than if you were 10 years younger because the chances, even if we manage to have an embryo, it's not mm -hmm. sure that it's going to implant. So that's why, let me see that, but that's why when we have our, our really you can't keep it patients easy. over 44, mm -hmm. the chance of them having a baby is probably 1%, 2% in most cases. Well, now I have a, and that's, there that's are- That's where we find a lot of uh, trisomy also in older because patients. Because, mm -hmm. You know, they can make eggs, but the number of them having babies is very yeah. low now. There, we've had a, some exceptions, and we can predict those because we have this new test called the AMH, which is a chemical test that predicts ovarian age, and that's an actually a nice advance that we've had in the last few years. So we can tell if there's a 45-year-old who has an AMH test that predicts her egg numbers or the or of a much younger woman, she might be one of those women who, a hundred years ago, would be having her ninth baby at age 45. You know, and she's going to have one at she's 47. There are those exceptions to the rule, but age is a huge problem, and this is and this is the, the reason. So these these ladies, sometimes they want to try IVF, and <coughs> what we try to do is talk them into not trying with their own eggs and use an egg donor because that mm -hmm. is hugely successful and trying to get pregnant in your late 40s is 20%, 15%, 5%, depending on the situation. And this, this is another, another advantage of oocyte banking in young 
ladies who are pursuing a, a professional career. Mm -hmm. Now they're banking their eggs. Mm -hmm. That's a new thing, yeah. Well, you have, so that's uh, a new idea, yeah. So all, so uh, all the ladies, who, the young ladies who have breast cancer, yeah. they bank their eggs before, yeah. before right. treatment. Uh, we have we have had a good number of those of those ladies who, before, they they are married or they are not married and they want uh, progeny, and they come to us. We we retrieve the eggs, we bank them, they have their chemotherapy, and four or five years later they come back to get their embryos. So what Ben was talking about is elective egg freezing for the young young professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people talk about it, and we actually had, when we were at RBA and had the first frozen egg success in the country, we had a lot of people calling us and wanting to have their eggs frozen, but guess how old they were? Not 32. They were 42, 44. Yeah. They wanted to have their eggs frozen. Well, those people, you really, it's too late to mm -hmm. try to freeze your eggs to preserve them. So. Um, there's a company here in this country, in fact, they're involved in Atlanta, trying to promote elective egg freezing. Um, I wish them well. I think most 32-year-olds, unless they're in New York, working on Wall Street or for a big law firm or in San Francisco working for Google, uh, most people are not going to do that. It might be wise for them to do it, but they just are not going to make that investment, they think. They just don't give it a priority. It's an option, though, and it's it's available and it's done. And I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want to sort of poo-poo it or make fun of it at all. I just think people don't do it as much as some people think they should. That, uh, Google. That, I think Microsoft. Probably well, right. Some of the big companies out there are are, are giving it as an option in their healthcare plan. But, yeah. but how many people work for Google nationally? I mean, there's a lot of people in out west who do, but not in Atlanta. So, well, we just don't see a, a lot of demand for it. I mean, in an ideal world, uh, it's, probably, it's probably going to increase. In an ideal world, healthcare coverage would include all infertility treatment, including in vitro fertilization in this country, like it does in France and Spain and England and Finland. And everywhere else in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. Canada. So that's a political football. Yeah. But trying to get that passed in this country as a as a law, so saying healthcare companies uh, have to cover it is not going to happen. Um, and honestly, what hap the dynamic of all of this involves? Let's say, okay, so. If you're going to have a, if your company is going to offer healthcare coverage, uh, it's going to spell out everything it covers. It's going to cover CAT scans. It's going to cover child childbirth. It's going to cover gallbladder surgery. Is it going to is it going to cover uh, hit, um, glasses? Is it going to cover dental? And is it going to cover infertility? And what happens is the people who are buying the insurance are the employers and they make these decisions. So unless there's a mandate in a state, and there are 11 states around the country that have certain some infertility mandates, but most states don't and Georgia doesn't and never will. So if it, some enlightened companies do include that as a, as a benefit of their health care plan, and in an, in an ideal world, they would all include it up to a up to, I w would say, up to a certain point. Um, and the reason I make that, make that statement is you can sort of overdo it. And, and for example, in Massachusetts, I've heard colleagues talk about uh, the 43-year-old who just won't give up and comes back for, wants to come back for her fourth egg retrieval and she's getting two eggs and her chances of getting pregnant are 3%, 5%, and there ought to be a way to, to cap it. But but I would argue that uh, maybe someday we'll have uh, infertility coverage. I'd like to think that would happen. 
infertility treatment coverage, not just for in vitro, but for insemination, uh, infertility surgery, all of these things should be covered. Do you have many requests for gender selection? We have some, and we do gender selection. So uh, it's, I'm gonna say one a month, something like that. And it's people who typically have a cultural, uh, more than more than maybe your culture or my culture might have pressure to have a male child. There's certain cultures where the male child in a family is becomes a huge issue, and they've had girls. I mean, honestly, it's way more often for wanting a male child. There are some who want a girl but it's probably 20% female and 80% male. So we offer that and it's done with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. You can check the chromosomes, rule out the, the abnormal ones and only put the back the male embryo or the female as the case may be. So it's very doable and it's basically the way I look at it is people are gonna make this choice. So. It might not be my choice, but it's their choice. In, in India, a, a young woman cannot inherit a piece of land. So when, when an Indian couple has land in India and they have only two daughters, they, they are in trouble because the government will confiscate the land. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Would, well, that's, what, that's what I was told by Indian bishops. <laughs> okay, so, but, okay, but just uh, the, that's one of the cultures that has a high value on having a male child, but even when they move to this country, they still want that male mm. child. Uh, I don't know if it's inheritance because they're here, if they live here, uh, those laws wouldn't apply, but it may, it's just family tradition and pressure. So it's a reality in that culture. And some, some Muslim uh, sects uh, have a lot of pressure to have a male child. And some Asian people. <laughs> I'm going to say the sort of Judeo-Christian groups that are sort of the majority population don't do that so much. But then there are, there are, there are couples who have several or even let's just say two of one sex and they want another child and they really don't want to roll the dice and do the 50-50 and they've got the time, money and energy to do this, make this choice and they do. And, and then there's the genetic screening when the, you, had, you had a couple who, was, who had uh, two children who were deaf, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, well then there's... Congenital deafness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, we can look for that uh, gene, particular gene, and they were looking for Yeah, so yeah, pre-implantation genetic selection Di diagnosis. or diagnosis can be used for a variety of uh, recessive disorders ranging from cystic fibrosis to, uh, well, there's at least 100 diseases you can screen for now. Mus More than that. Mus muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy, certain types of blindness, deafness, sickle cell disease, uh, spinal muscular atrophy is another one that's not so rare. So we now screen all of our patients before they get pregnant for a variety of these diseases. And so then they make the decision of whether to go ahead or not. Well, if they if a, if if a, if both the man and the woman come up with what I call a hit on the same gene, bad gene, then you do pre-implantation genetic selection on their embryos and don't put back the affected embryos. So the, if you have a, if it's a recessive disorder of the normal embryos, one out of four would be affected. Mm -hmm. So most of them are still okay. I was, I was thinking about the disability community and how they might feel about this hmm. selection. So it's just, it's interesting how... Well, it depends, I guess, on how bad the disorder is. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, right. There would be some argument about, let's just say, deafness. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You could make an argument that that's not a good reason, but but let's put it this way: the the parents of somebody who might have a, a the parents given the choice may decide they really don't want to take the risk of having a child with deafness. Mm -hmm. It seems that for all the advances, then there are more ethical and so on uh, issues to ethical and legal issues to to deal with. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, one thing I did want to ask is I noticed that egg donation is something that's mentioned on your website as being something that you really encourage. Do you get do you get as much egg donation as perhaps sperm donation was in the past, or is it about the same? Or well, s sperm donation is really uncommon now <clears throat> because of ICSI. Okay. So. Uh, only men who have zero, practically, or let's just say zero sperm, and you can't, some men who have zero sperm on a sperm count have sperm in their testicle, and you can do surgical retrieval of the sperm and get a few sperm. Mm -hmm. But if they really have zero sperm, then they have to have a sperm donor, and it's it's very small proportion of our treatments now. And of course, they don't really need IVF. They can the women can have insemination with donor sperm successfully. For donor sperm, actually the biggest use of donor sperm in this country is gay women couples, lesbian couples. Um, if you ask the sperm banks who uses it, that's who uses it. Uh, there's a good bit of that. And we, of course, treat lesbian couples like anybody else. I say, of course, uh, as far as I know, all the infertility clinics in Atlanta and do. Mm -hmm. There's some some places that, that don't, and uh, a neighboring state to our west, <laughs> uh, and certain other southern states. It's hard for them to get service, so they come to Atlanta sometimes or Augusta. Mm -hmm. What do you think is perhaps the greatest barrier to your practice today, and also what do you think about the future in your field? What does that look like to you? What do you want to answer the barrier one? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't uh, Cost. I, can, I cannot think of it the barrier. Cost. Cost is the biggest Cost, barrier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we still, I mean, we're low cost guys, but we have people who do it once and can't do it again if it doesn't work. Um, you know, they saved up all their money and that's right. it. Right. If it works, it's great, and if it didn't, it's bad. So we need to have uh, health care plans change. It's not going to happen next year, but I think in the, in the, somewhere in the future. Well, like, actu uh, actually, we, I, don't, I have mixed feelings about that because when we deal with insurance companies, we are sure to be to be on the, on the wrong side of well, yeah. Of the, so of, the next of the generation. So, yeah. so we'd rather I'd rather deal with patients who are going to pay cash, uh, low payment, like mm -hmm. <laughs> than have to deal with the insurance that are going to they're going to get us no matter what. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so they, it's a double edged, do that double edged sword, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, my friends and co colleagues in Massachusetts complain because the reimbursement is so low and it's hard for them to make a decent living. But uh, so I mean, the future is another whole. You want to talk about that? Yeah, let's talk about that. The brave new okay. world. <laughs> okay, so there's research um, now that allows uh, stem cells to be turned into eggs. Okay, so women someday who don't have eggs or are running out of eggs or are menopausal could plausibly have stem cells taken from their skin or the inside of their cheek or whatever and have those cells grown into eggs. Now, when is that? Well, let's say 20 years from now. I mean, realistically, I, I don't know exactly because, um, but someday and then can you do the same thing for sperm? So I'm going to ask Ben this question. Basically, could you make two eggs, let's say a, 
let's say the man doesn't have any sperm and the lady ha doesn't have any eggs, could you make two eggs and fuse them and make, I mean, in essence, eggs and fuse them and make a baby? Or do you need something in sperm? Is there something yeah. about sperm in the centrosome that you must that have very, very, in, human, very in humans? Complicated. I tell you the truth, I don't know. Okay, so nobody knows yet. No, but, Cause, but I suspect that there are probably laboratory experiments underway in mice with which, you know, there are different strains of mice. Some, you know, they, they don't even, <clears throat> they never read the book about some of these things like capacitation mm -hmm. and not developing if mm -hmm. you take them out of the ovary and, and grow them from primordial oocytes and fertilize them and transfer them and get baby mice, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And so stem cell technology is moving so rapidly. And what we didn't know before Dolly was cloned that somatic cells from an adult could be reprogrammed by taking the nucleus and putting it into an egg. The environment of the egg fostered the development of embryos, mm -hmm. but now they are doing with stem cells. Like you can take, everybody still has stem cells in the bone marrow, you know. Or in the uh, hair follicles. Yeah, the, okay. the very rudimentary mm -hmm. cells in the body. And if they learn to reprogram them into eggs, and there are experiments that have not been repeated that have been done many years ago with nuclear transfer without the sperm's influence. Hoppy and Ilman Z, I think, had some offspring. And I'm vague on the, I knew at the time, in fact, I site visited their lab at Bar Harbor for NIH. And I was convinced that they did exactly what they said. They're honest people, but nobody can ever repeat it. Mm -hmm. So these things so, will become possible. So well, could you get basically two people without sperm and eggs, two, two men to make a baby, one of them makes the eggs and one of them has the sperm. <laughs> The egg part probably is more, is easier than the sperm because there's something magical about the sperm and fertilization, perhaps. But well, but anyway, we, we used to think that we don't sure. know. We don't now know we exactly. Don't really know. We don't know. And uh, those are possibilities. But I think the big barrier there, again, at least in my mind, would be the ethics of the whole thing. And uh, well, why would it be unethical? Do we want to do this? Why would it be unethical? <laughs> Can't we treat disease? <laughs> <laughs> Can't we take care of people who need physicians mm -hmm. and instead of well, oh, if you know, know, but, but, but in the genesis. making more yeah, problems? You get, you get uh, an asexual yeah. as, as right. as, as individual yes. who is ne neither a woman nor a man. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, one of the things that has popped up on my computer in the last week is the idea, it's not really just an idea, it's based on studies mostly in animals but some in humans, that, that sperm uh, could contribute to problems in their abnormal lifestyles in men could contribute to problems in a child downstream. Okay, now I'm going to give you an example. It's well, one well-documented example is older men, let's just say my age, who decide to marry a younger woman are at pretty high risk of having a child who has, or definitely at higher risk than normal for having a child with schizophrenia or autism and a couple of other disorders I can't remember. So it's, so their chromosomes didn't change, but there's something called the epigenetic switch. And epi so the, 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 uh, let's just say a switch on a gene gets turned off that should be on, and it can be passed down to the child so that the child is, has autism. 
Okay, so there's some evidence in animals, and possibly this could translate to humans, that, that too much alcohol, obesity, smoking in a man could change the epigenetics of his sperm and affect a child downstream. Now, um, I think that's in the future for us to be able to decipher this and perhaps be able to tell when it happens. Maybe you could, I don't know if you could select the, ha the healthy sperm in a guy like this. I mean, that's, that's beyond plausibility, but uh, it might motivate men to change their habits and their lifestyle if they knew that all of a sudden they were at risk. I, mean, I think it definitely, I've had cases uh, on, the, on the, the issue of the man's age where the man said, you know what, I'm 65 and I've got a younger wife. It would be really smarter for me to use a donor sperm than to take this risk of having a baby with an autism and went ahead and did that. So uh, that's not common, but um, because of the autism risk is still not huge, but it's it's considerable and it's a you know it's a major problem if it happens. So so I think we're going to learn a lot about that in the future. That's another five ten years from now, and maybe. Uh, when we celebrate the 100th anniversary of Louise Brown in 2078, and IVF is available and it's just out there for anybody to use as part of their life plan, well, things will be a lot different. I think you will get the answer when you interview the next generation. From us, you're going to get a better, yeah. a better but, history of, of IVF. Then. But already, life is complicated with our environmental toxins and chemicals mm -hmm. that we're exposed to daily. Just mm -hmm. myriads of potential influences in well, this way. Exactly. So there's a lot of talk. Yeah, there's a lot of research into that. How how um, the the toxins and the foods that we eat that are processed and are, in, are, are packaged in plastic, how they could possibly affect our sperm and eggs. Is, there's a, lot to, and, and there's once, a lot, lot to learn about that. Well, well, we, already know, we already know that the sperm counts have decreased tremendously from, the, oh. from when we started to measure the, 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 the averages. The averages, the concentration of sperm was normally from 120 to 150 million spermatozoa per ml in a, in a, in a, in an ejaculate. And now we, th we think that uh, 20 to 30 million spermatozoa per, per ml is normal. But, and we, we've, we've seen that. Our generation has seen mm -hmm. that. We have seen mm -hmm. that, that, that this, this slow decrease. And uh, we know that there are some countries where we, they have to perform ICSI, like uh, um, I'm just going to say, uh, I've got some uh, friends who, are, who go to uh, ICSI in, uh, in Saudi Arabia because they have a, they consume water that is desalinated and uh, mm -hmm. they, have, they, have, they have to deal with hydrocarbons and they think that uh, that hydrocarbon is causing oligospermia in most, most men who, mm -hmm. who consume the water there. Hmm. And these alterations that Joe was talking about with epigenetics, once the DNA is changed and passed to the next generation, that generation passes it to the next generation. Mm -hmm. So we have a narrowing of health mm -hmm. if we don't do things properly. I wonder if and we don't really know what yeah. properly means. That's the big problem. So, so let's we need to battle for more research funds in reproduction. Right. Absolutely. To, to save human and, lives. And, and I'm going to just say, you know, this whole thing started with science, right? Mm -hmm. Ben and his friends uh, all over the world made this possible. And now we, and it's exposing a need for more science. We need more support for science. We need more students in the field. Uh, and there's such a tension now between science and anti-science, and we're seeing it even in our legislative bodies and so on. And so there's 
that's going to be a, a constant battle, I think, yeah. in, in the future as we go forward. I think if, if, if in the education of children, they learn about facts mm -hmm. and data and truth, and it just seems to me that common sense would enable people to put things together and where there's bad science, throw it out. But where there's good <laughs> science that has some documentation, accept it and try to build on that. And just to know the difference might be puzzling to a lot of people, but with uh, some more education about considering the facts behind statements would be extremely valuable. Yeah, she's talking about the tension between facts so, and beliefs. Yeah, right. That's the problem. Well, Some people believe certain things because oh. they do and because they've been taught it and it's because it's their... I'm going to just get back to... Just take... I'm going to take my... Let's just say other cultures who believe that it's really important to have a boy, okay? It's not really the same thing. Okay. It's not really the same thing because... It's not about science, it, but uh, people have beliefs that come down to them from their traditions, their religion, and sometimes science gets in the way of that. I, so I've we, never, I'm arguing for your side. I've never seen the discrepancy between science and religion. I mean, you know... <laughs> you haven't? But it's... No, because I think... I think God gave us brains to be able to reason and, and, to, and to interpret and to use our common sense. Well, and to use our common sense. Well, I'll give you an example. And my case rests. <laughs> well, I'll give you an example of uh, a relative of mine who said um, we we're talking about creationism and and yes. evolution, yes. and his statement was. Why shouldn't a child be taught both creationism and evolution? Okay. In school. Okay. So well, what? my answer is creationism doesn't belong in school. Creationism is a biblical teaching according to a certain biblical, yeah. according to a certain yeah. religion, yeah. right? Okay. The Hindus don't teach it that way. The Muslims don't teach it that way. Agnostics and atheists don't teach it that way. It's a, it's our sort of like the dominant. We get it. It's the dominant, school. right? It belongs in Sunday school. That's sort of my point. It shouldn't. It's my point is, it, and I didn't argue because I, I didn't. He'd had too much beer for me to convince him any <laughs> otherwise. But you see what I'm saying? Yes. That his religion is taught. It makes him think that creationism is a is a possibility, okay? Yes. The, the, you know, this is a 10,000-year-old planet. So, and that, when you start getting into stuff about reproduction, those kinds of viewpoints uh, muddy the waters in peop in, for people who, the c same sort of group of people who want to call uh, embryo, for, uh, an eight-cell embryo a person. You, you, and, cannot, you cannot argue with beliefs that are based on... Uh, in, no, are based on, on books that are not scientific. Some, well, some so things you cannot, you cannot argue I mean, that you know. Some the, things are fact based, and some mm -hmm. things. Yeah, that so. was one of the things I remember that my major professor Bill Williams, who was an expressed, he was a non-believer, and uh, but he did say to me that some things. I just cannot be proved scientifically. And faith is here. We have our faith, mm -hmm. what we believe, our beliefs, mm -hmm. and we have science. Science can only go so far. And then there's another dimension. And that dimension has not been cracked scientifically, not even by Einstein. But he came close. <laughs> He's closer than anybody else, mm -hmm. I guess. But that's where we are, and our understanding is 
just that of mortals. And I think our, our culture will always or less. have that tension. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was a good conclusion. But we have to yes. accept it. <laughs> right. We have to accept it. I cannot say how much I appreciate your being with us today. I think this has been a wonderful contribution to history and research. And I appreciate your giving your time to be here. We hope some graduate student looks at this someday. <laughs> we do too. Right on, and we right will on, encourage right it. Or maybe <laughs> college freshmen. From, from, from the up, upper reaches of the tomb below. <laughs> and we will encourage that for sure. Thank you very much.